Good morning, everyone. I am sure in some areas I should say good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Uncut Part Two. Uh, part Two. This one is mending the wounds. Today we're. I'm excited. I hope you are excited um, because we have some dynamic speakers today, and I don't know what they're going to talk about, but I know what God is going to release, and that's good enough for me. And so I wanted to take a moment to just thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules for, um, for coming in, joining in the Zoom room, or should I say the uncut room. Um, I will go ahead and give you a few housekeeping notes. I have muted everyone. And the reason why I have done that, as you are aware, because we are recording, we want to make sure that the distractions are at bay. And most importantly, that... There is no background noises, especially when the speakers are coming on. There is no distraction. There is no, you know, moving around and things of that nature. So if you find yourself off of mute, I would ask, kindly ask that you put yourself back on mute to respect not only your co um, registrants, but most importantly, those who will be speaking, uh, because we want to make sure that you receive everything that you need to receive. Sit back relax, enjoy the ride. I would ask if you're in a place where you're quiet or if you're, uh, if you're not mobile, um, please get out a pen and paper because you will need to take some notes. Uh, yes, we will be recording it and I will be sending the recording out to those who are registered only. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, I'm only going to be sending the recording out to those who have everybody in the room. I am going to allow my beautiful speakers to introduce themselves. Um, I had a little blurb for them, but I want to give them the liberty to, of introducing themselves. Just kind of share with you guys just a quick snippet of who they are, and you'll figure out where they come from when they come up and they begin to uh, labor on the platform. So I'm going to go first with a uh, I call her my sister friend, um, Dr. Akila uh, Davis. I'm going to let her introduce herself to you all. Following her, it will be Apostle Angelica, which is also a sister friend. And then finally, my spiritual mother, none other than Dr. K, AKA the Pusha. Kingdom blessings, everybody. I am a uh, Apostle Dr. Akila T. Davis, currently residing in Houston, Texas, uh, where we pastor. I pastor alongside my husband, Apostle Mike Davis, Second Chance Worship Center. I am elated for the opportunity um, to see what God has in store for us and how the Holy Spirit will move on today. Um, I'm just, I'm just super excited. I see some of my spiritual babies on here. God bless you all. Thank you all for joining. I'm just excited to be among such powerful women in God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. For those of you that are all over the place, good evening, <laughs> wherever you're tuned in from. Um, I am Apostle Angelica Montgomery. I am very, very excited to be here. I know that there is a lot in store to unpack in these next few moments. And um, yeah, L let's see. When I say I'm excited, I'm excited because I definitely don't know about y'all, but something's been going on, been stirring about this here meeting. And um, I just know that truly God is working on us and preparing us for what he is doing. Um, thank you all to uh, my, my spiritual daughters that I see on. Um, thank you, thank you so much for joining and supporting our, uh, as they call, Apostle Auntie. <laughs> Amen. Hello, 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 everybody. Greetings and so much love and appreciation to everybody that's on today. I'm Apostle Dr. Kinesia Mouton, 
And I'm just honored to be with you ladies on today. This is a passion of mine, always pouring into other women. And so I'm excited about what God is going to do. I'm here to pour as well as receive. I'm in Glen Heights, Texas, which is a part of Dallas, Texas. And I am a member of MMU Ministries, where I co-pastor with my husband, Pastor Jeff Mouton. And praise God for all the spiritual daughters that are on here on today that are near and far. And kudos to my spiritual daughter that is hosting this today. So godly proud of her and all the endeavors that she is allowing God to stretch her in. And so I'm just ready. I'm ready to receive as well as release because I trust the vessels that are pouring into us on today. And I've had, um, I guess you would even say a feeding from both Akila and from Angelica. So I already know we in for a treat and I know my very own daughter, she's going to come with it. So, hey, it's about to go down. So. Amen. I'm trying to find a song that is befitting before we go straight in. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. All right, all right. Let's get to the meat, right? Let's get to the meat. Y'all excited? I know I am. I got my pen and my paper ready. I'm ready to take some notes. I don't know about y'all. Without further ado, let us welcome to the platform our very first speaker. Uh, none other than Apostle Dr. Akila Davis. Like I said before, she is, I call her sister friend. I can't call everybody friend and I will not call everybody friend. Um, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. But anyway, I am, I am honored to call you friend. Uh, she is, as she mentioned before, she is the co-laborer of Second Chance Worship Center with, uh, alongside with uh, Apostle Mike, actually we could say Apostle Dr. Mike Davis now. Um, she is also the founder of Trailblazing Ministries. Uh, she serves as a member of the IWAM, which is led by Apostle Dr. D. Taylor Brown. Apostle Akila is also the mother of three beautiful adult children. I had an opportunity to lay my eyes on them. They're a beautiful children. And she has three bonus children as well as uh, four beautiful granddaughters. Let us welcome Apostle Akila on the platform. Take it away. Amen, amen. Again, uh, what an honor and a privilege. Um, I give all praise, glory, and honor to our Heavenly Father uh, for allotting me and entrusting me and, and pouring and parting in me and in releasing me. And I thank you. I give honor to the visionary um, of Titus to Women and in um, and, and such a vast and plethora of ministries that she has in her belly and yet to even walk in my sister, friend, apostle, Dr. Michelle Foster, I give honor to you. Thank you so much for trusting me and um, the God in me and for giving a lot of me this opportunity. Um, and I'm so grateful that God even gave me the grace uh, to be able to be here uh, with moving time. Amen. Um, to, to all of my uh, co-laborers in Christ, to my bestie, my sister, uh, Apostle Kinesia Mouton, and to the Apostle Angelica Montgomery, to the prophetess that are on the line, and to everyone else, greetings um, in the Lord, name of our Lord and Savior, Yahshua Yamasi. And then in, even in the absence of my husband, I give honor to him, uh, for he is my covering. And I thank him for us being in unison to allow each other to be able to minister um, amongst God's people. Um, just wanted to get that part out of the way. And I just wanted to, if I could, just open up in a word of prayer um, as we can come and gather together. Father, in the mighty name of Yahshua, Yahmashiach, Jesus, who is the anointed one, the Messiah. We just thank you for this uh, wonderful day. We thank you, Lord God. This is the day that you have made and we share rejoice and be glad. And then I declare and decree, Lord God, that you will move Lord God, and you will move ourselves out of the way. I thank you, Father, that we are decreasing our flesh, that you will stand erect in us, Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for every speaker, Lord God, that will speak, that you will move to them. I thank you that you're allowing us to be a conduit of who you are. And I thank you, Lord God, for even the vessels that you would sensitize their ears and tenderize their hearts to hear what they say of the Lord on today. 
I pray, Father God, that you will move like only you can. Take free course in this conference, in this gathering. And Lord God, I pray, Father God, that you will orchestrate and guide our mouths, Lord God, and only speak what it is that you will have us to speak for this hour that is so prevalent, Father God, and so pressing that many of that are hurting will be healed and many broken hearts will be mended, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord God, that you would just do something supernatural and stir up and cultivate every gift of every believer, Lord God, that we, we may go and walk away from this thing running to help those that don't know you, that our lifestyles will exemplify just who you are. And for that, we just give you glory. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm just so honored and elated. And I want to, so forgive me, I want to try to breathe for a second and take my time because I'm so excited um, as I've been meditating on what it is that God wanted me to say. And so um, when I first initially, I looked at it and I had to continue to just keep looking at what the flyer said and what, and so I can hear the heartbeat of the apostle that the Lord gave this assignment to. And it says, uncut, mending the wounds. And at first, it kind of seemed like it could be kind of contradicting to each other to be uncut, but yet mend the wound. <laughs> um, and then um, as I began to study, and then I really did not go deep into the actual scripture that we're standing on, which is Psalm 147 and 3, until this morning. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> kind of bring that up a, a little bit and walk through another particular scripture. And I believe that in God's uh, wisdom and his strategic plan um, of how he even allowed us to line up, I, I really trust and believe that my sisters that will follow under me, we will all be linked in on how, uh, what God is saying to us. I want to start and share a little bit just about myself so you can understand um, kind of a prophetic demonstration or whatever that the Lord allowed me to experience just the other day. Um, I am by profession um, a general manager. Um, I'm in restaurant management. And um, I would recently have been promoted to that particular uh, assignment. I've been an assistant general manager for quite some time of the company that I work for. But the other day, I'm up, um, just ending my second week, going into my third week of my new, uh, my new uh, uh, seat at my location that I just took over. But there's a certain one of my line cooks just the other day. Um, injured himself at work. He was uh, cutting open some, some meat and uh, he cut himself very, very badly. And there was blood that was going everywhere. Uh, I was in the front of the restaurant and I saw him run past me and go to the bathroom. And as I rushed in the back to see what was happening, I said, why, what happened? Cause he just kind of just rushed past me. I uh, went in the back and I start, looked on the floor and saw that there were drips of blood, a, a trail of blood that followed him to where he went. Now, obviously, I had to, you know, once he came back, once again, making another mess. Y'all, please just hear me. He made another mess coming back, even back to where I was. I had to immediately pull out our biohazard kit and begin to take precautions because there was now blood splatters all everywhere that he went everywhere that he trailed, he left a trail of blood where he was. And so of course I wanted to make sure that we begin to administer some type of first aid to help him out. Of course he was panicking as a young man and then he was in pain, immediate pain. Um, and I knew what to do because my, uh, in my past, not just because I'm the manager, but I have worked in the health, medical health field for about 13 years prior to me moving to Texas. And, uh, and then another cook, she actually had went to school for her to be an LPN. So both of us had put on gloves and began to administer some first aid to this young man on his hand. And he had soaked through about three or four of my towels, began to feel the blood as we went to the sink to try to rinse it off. It filled, I mean, blood was just everywhere. So I told him that he needed to try to calm down and we wrapped his hand um, as my other cook applied pressure and lifted his hands up above his heart in, 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 in efforts to try to begin to slow the bleeding down and so that it would begin to come to some kind of halt. Um, but he was panicking 
because of the wound that he had now afflicted upon himself and everything. And he was bleeding everywhere. And we finally had got him to calm down a little bit, set him down. He began to feel woozy and lightheaded. And so we got him a seat. I got him something to drink. And as I kept his hand uplifted, um, I had, we had one, the cook holding his hand and applying pressure to the wound while, while also lifting his hand above his heart. So that way the slowing, the, the halt, there can be a halt come down to the bleeding and gushing so I can at least look to see how badly he was injured. And in the meantime, we had some things, some cleaning up going on because again, he had now damaged the product. I had to throw about a case of burgers away because he had cut himself over the burgers that he was opening. That is now cross-contaminated, which means I'm gonna lose money on that inventory as loss. And also I had to clean a whole lot of area and remove people six feet in every direction because now we had bodily fluid that was out and that's part of following the protocol whenever you have bodily fluid, especially in a place of a restaurant or even though it was in the back, he had still traveled through because he had panicked. Now, as we got him calmed down in the blood, I'm going somewhere, y'all just be patient with me for a moment. As the blood had you know, slowed down finally and I, I had to call, we use a company called MedCorp that we call for any kind of uh, team member injuries, uh, whether they're small, minute or major. Um, of course, I would dial 911 first if he was really, really bad, but I called MetCorp to put in the order to let them know we had an injury that was on there. That's part of the protocol. Um, the nurse at the time took and spoke to him and got, you know, feedback from him, got a reference number. And of course, the end of the decision was to send him to the ER because I can see inside the wound so much so I could see his bone. So I knew that he was going to need stitches and he needed to go to the ER. We did not have at the time it was a night shift and I did not have uh, urgent care to send him to. So I sent him to the ER. Of course, the company will pay for everything. Once he calmed down, I still, and I got him to a place where he was stable. I um, began to ask him now what happened. And he let me know that he was opening up burgers. Now our standard operating procedure for doing that does not require using a knife. You're supposed to peel back and open the burgers. The knives are used for prepping or to cutting or whenever you're you know, cutting a sandwich or something like that. He wasn't even, he shouldn't have been for the task that he was doing, that he was asked to do, did not require the usage of a knife in the first place. However, he was not following protocol. And even if he decided that he had to use a knife, there is a cutting glove that is readily available right in the area that he had to sustain the wound to himself, but he chose not to follow protocol, which in turn, it caused him to cut himself, number one, using a utensil that he had no, no business using for the task that he was using it on. And if he did so, he was not using the proper tools that would keep him safe from uh, and would prevent him from having the wound and the infliction or the injury that he had yet now sustained. And so now not only did he hurt himself, he caused a, a various uh, mess a mess that caused everyone to have to stop what they were doing to, to pay attention to him. I had to clean an area and remove people from where it was. It caused me inventory. It caused me to have to have waste. And not only that, now he has to be, uh, which is going to cost money because now it's going to come out of my P&L, my bottom line, um, probably close to $1,000 or more, depending on the medical um, thing that he has to pay. And not only that, he's going to be off of work for five days, which means now he's going to be missing because it falls under the seven days of where workers' comp kicks in at seven days. It's only uh five days and he'll be out. And not only that, but now I have to call and replace the shifts that he was um, on the schedule to work. And I have to rearrange everybody else's schedule to make them come in and work longer hours when they probably had other things to do. And being the fact that I'm the general manager, if my other supervisor or my management team cannot work, I will have to now and then rearrange my personal schedule to make sure that the needs of my store 
are met and all this affects my bottom line. Why? Because he did not follow protocol and he did not follow or even utilize the tools that we had in place, even if he, the contingency plan if he chose not to follow protocol but and we still had a contingency plan which were the ready-made cut gloves that you put on your hand that will help you to prevent from cutting yourself and beloveds I shared that long story to say we're talking about mending wounds now his wounds got mended at the ER they had to provide six stitches because he cut his thumb down to the bone he also cut his forefinger and he had to get six stitches all together in one finger finger and two in the other. And so now his wounds are mended and now he, he's healing time, which is going to cost him money because he will not be able to work. And it's going to cause us to have to shift everybody's life around. And now we're talking about uncut. Now I'm going to bring it in the biblical terms, if y'all just give me a minute. But I believe that everybody kind of got the painted picture of how in life God has given us protocol. He has given us law. He has given us order. He has given us direction and instruction. And many times, beloved, as much as I still had to show him compassion, and I did, as much as I had a contingency plan in place, we had the MedCorp people to call. There was doctors, there's hospitals that we sent to, to to stitch you up and to fix you up and all that. The fact of the matter is I, you still have to get to a point sometimes in life that we have to be coached we have to be reprimanded. We have to be rebuked. Come on, somebody. We have to go through the things of being chastised because even though God's give us grace and his mercy is everlasting, his grace is sufficient, but we still have to understand and get down to the nitty gritty that yes, many of us have wounds, whether it be broken heart from rejection, uh, being lied on, misunderstood, cheated, and all the sob stories that we have. And I'm not discrediting the things that we've been through that cause particular wounds to our hearts or, you know, breaking up in, in, in relationships or just being betrayed or all the different things that we have south wounds of addiction that could have been an open door from abuse from childhood rape molestation all those different things that we have but the fact of the matter is at some point we have to take accountability and ownership because of what sustained what came from the wound in the first place and I believe that because we are coming down to the wire at the very end of this uh 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 what's it called the hourglass of time that we are running out of Jesus is the Lord is saying to us I believe I believe that the Lord is what is he saying to us we're saying he's saying that we have to stop dealing with the symptoms of things and stop trying to get the woe is me and actually look at the picture of why are we having the wounds before we get healed let's look at the sustain because now I need to stop I have to now prevent what happened I'm going to patch you up I'm going to fix you up, but let's look at why we got this, the, the wounds in the first place. And I believe that's why the Lord had me um, to come on first. I'm going to try to lay a foundation um, so that the apostles can come behind and give you the grace that you need after we clean out the wound and figure out and, and, and let's, let's, so let's back it up. Let's back it up. I want to, I want to walk through some things. Now I look at Psalm 147. Glory to God, the precious psalms, the psalms of prayer, the psalms of adoration, and the songs of crying out, the, the, the book that gives us the foundational writings of prayers and, and, and melodies unto God. And, and it is such a beautiful Psalm 147 and 3 that says, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Blessings be to God. That's who he is. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God that heals. And he is, but I can't stop at one of Psalm 147, three, without wanting to go over to the book of Isaiah 61. The book of Isaiah 61, one through about four, because it runs parallel to that. And we're going to end up in another scripture, but I'm trying to lay a foundation here. So y'all bear with me. For those who are taking notes, I said Isaiah 61, verse one, and I'm going to read it very real briefly. And it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord have anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Uh, he have sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison of them that are bound 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of the uh, joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I'm reading all this because I believe as today as apostles that the Lord has given us this magnitude of an assignment to help you all figure out how the, how can we help you to mend the wounds um, and how can we come in such an uncut raw place um, to really start dealing with these things and these issues that many of us have been dealing with I believe for years and and and, and I believe that today there's going to become a halt where I declare and decree that after today there will be no more cycles of returning back to your vomit there will be no recycles of returning back to the things where we're continually to uh to revisit the same hurt over and over and over again we're gonna today is the day i declare and decree that you will not go back to the altar for the same thing that you went back for last sunday and last night lord it's me again standing in the need of prayer at least let it be a new wound at least let it be a new prayer because we keep going back and reopening the same wound why because we have not stopped the habits and the behaviors that we had now god is a healer we just read it but i believe that as a preacher of the gospel and the, those who are on the platform to teach on today we're coming to bring you good tidings but before we get to the part of of the the, the men the broken heart this is my job because we have to deal with why do we have a broken heart in the first place where did all this stuff come from why is it that i have to keep going through the things that i'm going through and now i get to my favorite part of what my main assignment is so i'm going to come to you all today out of Isaiah 1. So we're in the same book and we're going to walk briefly through Isaiah 1. Now I'm going to ask my lovely apostle sister, somebody keep me on time to kind of do this when I'm running close to time because I don't, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm just looking straight ahead and I'll be looking in the word. So when I, if I start going over, because I get excited, I'm in my Bible husband. Y'all do like this. So, amen. <laughs> amen. All right. As, as the body of Christ, as a nation, uh, is in particularly the nation that we live in here in the United States of America, there are so many things that have been going on, going wrong, and we are seeing the, the uh, we are seeing the after effects and the aftermaths of years and years of years of backsliding and falling and all those kind of things. And for years, the Lord has tried to uh, has cried out the Lord has given us way of escape um, for years and centuries upon centuries the Lord has uh, even had to chastise us and then give us an opportunity to get it right again um, and we have done a very good job of failing God and a very good job at um, blaming other things and other people for the things I'm mentioning as a nation but if you bring it to your own house and look upon ourselves because I believe today is going to be a day of self-reflect self-reflection. A day is a day. And I said, I know it may sound harsh, but sometimes we have to deal with the nitty-gritty because I believe that the problem is many of us, when you think about it, when you go through things, we want the system, the, the symptom, excuse me, to go away. We present the symptoms to the doctors. We present the symptoms to our pastors, to our counselors, to our, to our mentors. We present the symptoms. My head hurts, my tummy hurt, my heart hurt. I want the pain to cease and stop. But in order for that to not continue to return, we have to look at what is causing it in the first place. Because what I think we need to understand and really realize and come into the to the to the total acceptance is pain is a is a mere reflection it is an indication that something is really wrong and and, and and there's some kind of infection or something going on on the inside and so we have to look at what is the infection so the prophet isaiah right at one and and, and i i was laughing when the lord gave me this because um, years ago, he gave me this, and I literally stayed in this for about a year or two. And it's for him to bring me back to this. I said, Lord, this is kind of harsh. He said, this is what I need you to tell the people. We're going to walk through this right now. It says, the vision 
of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's cred, but Israel does not know my name, my people. Uh, uh, but Israel does not know my people does not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors that have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds, but wounds, but wounds, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burnt with fire. Your land strangers devour it in your presence and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard as a lodge in his garden and cucumbers has besieged the city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant. That's those who are truly, truly seeking his heart. That's those that are truly, truly walking out and truly proclaiming the word, the gospel. Hallelujah. We should have been as Sodom and we would, we should have been unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. What, what purpose is a, mul a multitude of your sacrifice unto me, saith the Lord. I am full of burnt offerings, although I'm over it in the fat of the uh, beasts, and I, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or the, or the he goats. When ye come to appear before me who have required this in your hand to tread my courts, bring no more vain oblations, incense, and this abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me, and I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hand, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Here we go. Here's the good news. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil from your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be uh, as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I just want to speak briefly on a few things because here we are in this time that uh, the Isaiah, uh, the prophet Isaiah, he was living as a very time, was a time of a lot of tension. We are in a time of a lot of tension. There's a war that's going on. It's not even rumored anymore. There's literally a war going on right now. We have watched plagues and pandemics right before our eyes. We're seeing things that we have never seen before. Flocks and flocks of birds falling straight from the sky and uh, fish just raising from the water that are just found to be dead in the waters. This is not biblical times I'm talking about. I'm talking about right now, today, that we are seeing these things that are going on, my God, today. Um, and, and, and we are in a place of, 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 of mental chaos, 
uh, a a anxiety has taken over the minds of the people. Oppression and depression has really just smothered and hovered and is actually just really running mandate into the minds of the people. And I'm not talking about the unsaved. I'm talking about the saved. I'm talking about ones who proclaim Jesus to be Lord. I'm talking about the chosen ones. I'm talking about the pastors and the, the prophets and the apostles. We got pastors committing suicide and walking away, locking the doors of the church and reclaiming, declaring, decreeing out their own mouth, by their own confession, that they're not going to come back and continue to do God's work, retiring from a mantle that I had no idea that it's not biblical that you can retire from unless you get caught up and you go on home to be with the Lord. I'm talking about stuff that is happening. So where are we? We have wounds that are open. We have church, what we call church hurt. We have betrayal. We have all these different things that's going on. Why? And it stems from the place of disobeying God, turning around, turning away from his order, from his law, from his declares and decrees. And we left with the wounds that have been unmended because we have, we have refused to look at what, what happened. We refuse to look at, we have made some choices and decisions. And I say we as a people to turn away from God. We have, we have allowed the world to infiltrate the church instead of the church infiltrating the world. We have allowed prayer to be um, exercised out of our schools, out of our homes, out of our families. Uh, we have allowed, and those who are watchmen, have called them and watchmen on the wall, have, uh, have abandoned our posts in order to be seen and heard in places, in order to be able to relinquish titles. Um, to be able to get self-fame and self-glorification instead of bringing glory to God. And the truth of the matter is, if we don't turn from our wicked ways, we will not see or eat the beer to eat the good of the land. When things happen, we want the pain to stop. When things happen, we want the symptoms to go away. We want we we don't want to deal with the inconvenience. Of, of being of being chastised. We don't want the inconvenience of being rebuked. We don't want the inconvenience instead of really looking at our inner man and our inner self and the, and the true healing from wounds that we have or exposed will not truly be bound up and cause a true healing unless we deal with the infection that is on the inside. The book of Isaiah chapter one, it gives us a mere glimpse that God said, I'm bringing judgment. Judgment is not coming. Judgment is here. And we are in a time that we are now in the courtroom of and, and, and in front of the mercy seat of God. And it is time for us to have a true cry out. And we are truly under the mercies of, of the true living God. And what God is doing, he said, I'm about to judge some things. I'm about to let you see and truly understand what it is that where where you are, and I believe I'm I'm talking about the body of Christ. But if we can examine ourselves and look on the inside of ourselves, what have we allowed, and where are we? And like I said, it's not that you know, it's not the compassion is not there. I've my I'm, I'm not coming from a person who has. has closely even ever walked perfect, made many of mistakes. I fall daily. But what I'm saying is you have to come to the place where we say, how can I have pre pre prevent further injury? How can, what are the protocols that maybe I have broken? Like the young man I had to help and send off to the ER. What was the protocols that were broken? What were, what were the things that could have been used that I refused to use because I thought I had it? all by myself. I, I can make up some things as I go along. I'm anointed now. So now I don't need this particular thing to set in place to help me prevent from having what self-inflicted injury. It was really a self-inflicted injury. Why? Because he did not follow protocol. He did not utilize the tool that was readily available. We don't use the word. We, after a while, go on our own intelligence. We don't seek God. We want to. We, we we put Him on a shelf because now that we've gotten to a certain place with Him, so we think we can go ahead and put God in the back, and now we're going to take the front. We're going to take the, the driver's seat. And then when things happen, now God, I'm really not seeking Your face. I really want you. I don't want you to deal with the issue. I just want you to make the pain go away. 
I'm not, I'm tired of wearing this mask. I want the COVID to just go away because I'm inconvenienced. I want to go where I want to go and crowds that I want to go. And I want to go back to hosting my, my conferences and have all the big droves of people. I don't want to have to social distance. I don't want to have to be inconvenienced to cover up. I want to be able to be free and move about and go back to where I was when God said, I'm calling you out from where you were and trying to place you back where you, where you need to be. We're dealing with wounds here. We're dealing with, but if we don't follow the protocol and look at how we keep getting injured in the first place, you'll continue to find yourself in a vicious cycle. I failed to mention that this young man, I, I said, I'm going into my third week at my position. This young man, this is the second time I've had to call MedCorp for him. He constantly gets hurt. He's constantly doing something that's causing him to have injuries, self-sustained injuries. And, and, and I looked at this in the spiritual sense. How many of us keep going to the altar with these self-afflicted wounds? How many of us keep going back with the same issue? So, and, and it may not be the exact same wound. This time you burnt, last time you got cut, th last time you fell. Why? You didn't slip resistant shoes on. And this time I did this because I wasn't paying attention to what I'm doing. Where's your discernment? Where are you? Why are you not following protocol? How come you're not wearing the proper things that you need to wear. We're not girded up. We're not wearing the what the full armor of God like he gave it to us. We have the tools, but we refuse to use them. And it is silly and foolish to punch a nail in the wall when God gave you a hammer. And so you have a self-sustained injury. And after a while, I can't feel sorry for you. I can't continue to feel sorry for you. And now you've got a whole mess of blood bleeding on everywhere, bleeding on everything. Just get that, just a mess, a trail follows you everywhere you go. A trail of blood. And now I have to remove everybody from around you because you're a biohazard, a biohazard. And now I got to remove people six foot, can't nobody, now you don't social distance yourself. Six feet from the left, six feet from the right. The whole area is now infected. You're not affecting anyone. You're infecting your whole entire atmosphere. Your environment now is infected and they're losing inventory. Let's talk about inventory. What do you carry? If God has invested some, some anointing in you, he's invested his time, he's invested himself, the Holy Spirit, and you've wasted it because you refuse to follow protocol. Let me talk about protocol. I call it article number five, my God. Let, 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 let's, let's go protocol. I call it article five, 20. Twenty-one, eighteen. That's Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter uh, of the fifth book, chapter number twenty, verse number eighteen. That's that's my article. If y'all didn't know, uh, uh, but but because it shows about the law. But 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 article article five dash twenty dash. 18. And it talks about if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto him, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, this is our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is in glutton and is drunkard. And all the men in the city shall stone him with stones and, they sh and he shall die. So shalt thou put an evil from among you and all of Israel shall hear and fear. I need you to understand it's not just talking about family situations. This is God laying a law, a law to say any of my sons, we are sons of God, yeah? We are sons of God. If you are rebellious, I'm going to have to bring you in front of the elders and I will have to chasten you. Why? Because you're rebellious. We're rebellious and we wonder why we sustain wounds. We're rebellious and we wonder why sometimes God got to put us in, in captivity. 
But we love to quote the scripture, Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you, the thought of good and not of evil, to bring me to an expected end. God got a plan for me, hallelujah. But did you not understand that the plan is to bring you to an expected end? Did you not understand that this came out of the place of being sent to captivity? Why? Because you keep turning back and backsliding against him. The children of Israel refused. They integrated God with their, with their idols. They integrated God with their everyday life. And, the, and they forgot about the blesser and begin to worship the blessing. They forgot about the creator, begin to worship the creation. They forgot about what, what they said and they never honored their word back from God. They, they, they made promises. God, if you bless me with this, is that what we do? God bless me with this, I'll do that. If you give me this job, I'm going to tithe you. Never, the church never see an offering. The church never see a tithe. God, if you give me this car, I'm going to help people that didn't have a ride. You ride on past folk that need, they on a bicycle or ain't walking. You forget all about them. Why you begin to, to worship God? God, you bless me with this man, bless me with a husband, bless me with this. And now this man becomes your idol. So, you know, all these different things, your children become your idol. You worship them instead of worship the one true living God. Where he said, I am the only living God and there shall be no other God before me. And we wonder why we sustain these wounds in our life. Why? Because we forgot about him. And we come into a place of disobedience. And God says, the whole head is sick from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. Now you got wounds, you're oozing all over the place and oozing on everywhere. Stay nasty. There's no soundness in it. The wounds are just open and exposed, pus everywhere, smelling, all stinking, sin just everywhere. And now it's gotten so bad, you can't smell it because you've been living like that for so long. And I just want the inconvenience to go away. Patch me up. Sew me up, God. Put a Band-Aid on it. But I really still want to continue to do what it was that I was doing because it felt good. Can we just be honest with God? Hallelujah. Bless his wonderful name. I says your whole head is sick. A putrefying sores. And then we want God to do all the work. He said, no, not this time, baby. You're going to have to wash yourself. You're going to have to make yourself clean. You're going to have to learn to do right. Now, here's the grace. He said, learn to do right. Look at the text. He said, learn to do right. I'm going to give you grace, which means it's going to be time. And that means I'm going to have to walk you through a process. But that may mean that you may have to be sent to captivity. I might got to put you on spiritual lockdown for a minute. I might got to sit you down for a minute and allow you to go through a season or seasons until you begin to produce good fruit. I'm going to have to purge you and prune you and get all that stuff off of you and out of you. And you're going to have to sit there and sit out the time out. Some of y'all got to go to spiritual prison. And you're going to have to be there. As a matter of fact, what he told the children of Israel, go on and build houses and go on and plant vineyards because you're going to be here for a while. Because you can't seem to get it right. Your wounds are too awful. And since you got to learn to do right, I'm going to have to lock you up and put you in captivity until you get yourself together. The grace is in the process of time but you're going to have to revisit some things. So if you be obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. We cry out to God, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, come on. If my people, if is the smallest big word I've ever seen in my life. If my people who were called by my name, the remnant, shall humble themselves, follow the process and the plan and pray and seek my face, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Come on. Then <laughs> will I hear from heaven and heal their land. We want God to jump before the whole process. Just heal me, God. Most of us don't even really want healing. We just want to get delivered. We just want to feel good and a good shock. Touch me, pastor. Let me shake and make me feel all right for a moment. 
Let me get my spiritual high. But I really don't want to be healed because healing means that I got to walk through a process. Healing means that I got to follow the instructions and directions of the prescribing doctor. Healing means I got to take physically some medication and it got to continue on to the end until all the pills are gone. Healing means that I might have to change the dressing so the wound can actually get healed. Healing may mean I may have to do some work and put some work in. Healing means I got to be accountable and take ownership and acknowledge there's something wrong in the first place. Healing means to watch this. That means I'm going to have to relinquish some benefits that I may have been getting because somebody else was carrying me all the time while I was sick. And now that I'm walking in healing, I might not get those benefits. Everybody not going to carry me around, man, by the pool of Bethesda. I now got to pick up my, my bed and walk my own self. The very thing that was carrying me, I now got to carry it. I really don't want to be healed. Because that means now I got to show you what I'm really capable of. <coughs> now I got to show you what I really know how to do. And if I continue to be sick and down and wounded, I can, somebody can lift me up and, and I can hobble around because I got you as a crutch. We're talking about mending the wounds. This is uncut. And some of us been pacified for so long. I don't apologize because I refuse to be an enabler. My job as an apostle, apostle is to help build you up. And some of that means I got to tell you, there's someone here that's been utilizing the people and their leaders, the intercessors as a crutch. And the wounds that you have, they were once healing, but you decided to keep picking at the scab. Leave it alone and let it heal. It's wounded. We got putrefying sores. There's no soundness in it. Why? I had to ask God why. I wish I had time to really walk you through the whole Isaiah 1. First of all, we got to look at the time. Let's look at who they were talking to. He said, in the days of Uzziah and Hezekiah, this was a time that, the, that, the, that, that they were seeing a lot of prosperity. This was the time where there was a lot of transitional things going on, but there was money in the land, but yet they seen a transition. And you have to understand that sometimes when things seem to be looking great is when God will, be, will begin to expose the things in your life. And all of a sudden, there'll be a shaking in. All of a sudden, before I can go through this next transition, all of a sudden, I feel like I hit a oops and uh-oh or a hiccup. And now some other stuff is exposed. I said, he said, I'm not, I'm not taking no, everybody, I'm going to, everybody ain't going to another level. I'm not going to be the one to prophesy to you today. God ain't taking you nowhere if you don't get it right. He is not allowing no one to play church anymore. That's why the church doors are being closed. Ain't no playing church. Time out for the lights, camera, and action. You cannot hide behind ministry anymore. God is exposing. I heard many prophets cry out and say, this is the year of manifestation. Manifest, oh God. I hope you understood what you prayed and released out of your mouth. Manifestation means that some things have to be revealed and exposed. In order for to manifest, you got to see the whole picture. And sometimes we have to look at and see what was un undealt with. All the stuff <coughs> that you may have swept under the rug. And you wonder why you keep tripping. Everybody around you tripping. They tripping. Yeah, they tripping on your mess that you swept under the rug. And so now you got to expose those things. It's not about everybody else all the time. Sometimes the issue is you, is your inner man. So let's do some self-reflecting on today. Let's do some self-reflecting and ask God today to help me go through the process. He said, turn, you turn. 
He said, turn from your, wash yourself. How can I wash myself? I'm so glad you asked. Can I truly have a, a real prayer life? The prayer lines are great. There's so many, there's a plethora of prayer lines that we have for corporate prayer. The blueprints have been laid up. I know for myself that Apostle, they have morning glory prayer here. We got, we got this prayer here. We got this word going forth on this line, this word going, but do you have, do you have a prayer life? Have you established a relationship with God? Do you know his voice? Because I'm going to tell you something. Once you begin to graduate from a sheep to a son, God is not going to come to you in, a, in, a, in an earthquake, in a fire <coughs> all the time. Do you know his voice when he speaks to you in a still small voice? Or do you need this big thunderous stuff to happen, all the clapping and all that things? Do you have a relationship with the father to where he can talk to you and you hear him? And I say, how do I wash myself? Through his word, through prayer, through fasting. Do you agree to corporate fasting? Do you agree to fasting but really behind closed doors? You're not fasting. You don't live a fasted life. It's for show. Wash yourself. That's how you wash yourself. Get into the word. God's explained this to me. Walk, get washed through the word of God. You have to turn and make it. In your, I'm going to follow the protocol. I'm going to truly live a holy lifestyle. I want to truly have a life of worship. My life will exemplify who he is. This is not what I do. It's who I am. Lord, give me a transformation on the inside so I can go through a transfiguration. But many of us want it backwards. We want a transfiguration. We want everybody to see, but there's no change on the inside. That's why you continue to have these wounds that's spewing out on people. Like the young man made a mess everywhere because he didn't follow protocol. And every time he breaks protocol, he gets hurt. And that's not just his life that's affected. And you need to understand that today. It's not just your life that's affected. Everybody else got to shift and move because of what you refuse to do. Everybody else is affected and watches other people can get infected. Trying to come and run to your aid. Had I not have seen the blood splatters and somebody else touch some, the surfaces, Depending on what he carries in his DNA, they can now be infected. Other people's lives have to be maneuvered and changed in their schedules, all because you're now not in place because you got to go sit down. Because you have to go to captivity for a while. He's now in captivity. And other people now have to fill in for his stead because he didn't follow protocol because he got wounded, because it was really a self-inflicted wound. My God today. Hallelujah. So I just want to leave you with a thought before I wrap it up. I don't even know how long I've been on here. You got three minutes. Amen. I'm right on time. Hallelujah. I want us to change our mindset. The Bible says in John 14 and 6, the Lord says that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. In order to stop from, in order for us to get to the place where we can prevent the wounds, to stop the cycles that we're having self-inflicted inflicted wounds. We have to relinquish ourselves for our own from our own thought pattern. We have to relinquish ourselves from old habits. We have to relinquish ourselves from our own intelligence. We have to relinquish ourselves from the unnecessary and ungodly ordained fights and understand that truly it, He is the way. We have to reestablish our relationship with the Lord and follow his plan and not our own. We know the prayers, but now it's time to apply them. It's now time to apply them. Hallelujah.
I pray that you all were blessed on today. God bless you all. My T God. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, right? Boom. <laughs> A general, indeed, she is. But listen, she said something. She said a whole lot. But one thing I want to bring to everyone's attention, she said she wasn't coming with sugar coat. Apostles don't come with sugar coats. Apostles are not pastors where we just say, it's okay, baby. It's okay, baby. No, we don't do that. It's time out for that. Truth be told, it is time out. And she made another valid point. This is the very reason why the Lord is shutting the doors of the church. Because we call ourselves, we're not supposed to be sheep, bad. We're not bad. We should be beyond that. But we want to fall backwards. We want to fall backwards. Thank you, Apostle Sis. I, that, that word, I'm just like sitting here going. And you know, it's interesting when you sit before the Father and he gives you an assignment. Even us as visionaries, he gives us an assignment, right? And we ask the Father, okay, what is it that you want us to teach? And it was interesting. I went from one topic and I was struggling, or I, I like to use my word, I was struggling with it. Um, and it wasn't that I didn't hear him. I did hear him. But there was some wordplay that needed to be shifted around in order for me to gain an understanding from heaven of what he needed to have released. And so when I tell you, you all in the vein, that's God. When you know that when you prepare a message to release, and those that labor with you come before you and they all up in your stuff, you know that is Holy Ghost. He is paving the way. And what she did, she didn't open the door slow. She just said, boom. And so I pray that y'all really paying attention, that you're really, really paying attention because I honestly believe and I struggle, if I may be a little bit transparent before we bring on the next speaker, we did Uncut last year. And I heard a few people come back. I've heard it in the spirit. You need to do a part two. And I sat on it for a minute. I was like, okay, God, I sat, I literally sat. This month makes literally a year from when we did it last year. And I said, okay, God, you say Uncut part two, what? And I'm saying that to say, I had to sit for a moment and wait on the father to give me the instructions on what part two needed to take place. We are definitely in a season of being uncut. But I want to put out a disclaimer and warn you. Will you allow yourself to get on the table and let the father cut you? Or will you run and cause death unto yourself? She mentioned the, the boy, the young man. He didn't follow instructions. Listen, Apostle Keely, when I tell you, you all up in my teaching on strong roots, you are all, I'm, I'm so serious. You all up in the seven week teaching that we talked about. I said, okay, my God. And then you turn around and hit on the Bible study that we did, yes, um, what, a couple of days ago. I said, really? But that lets, that lets me know it's a reminder that God is saying, you are hearing my voice. Don't get it twisted. We as leaders, we have struggles too. We're not exempt. We have our own struggles. And our struggles be greater because we carry in our own self plus yours. So to constantly be reminded from the Lord, yes, daughter, you're hearing me. Yes, daughter, you move forward. Yes, daughter, this is the topic. Yes, daughter, you do X, Y, Z. It's not about us. It's about each and every one of you who chose to log on today to receive the meat of the Lord. The question is, are you going to chew it and digest it? That'd be the question. Get your fork out, get your knife. 
and put it before you and cut them pieces of real small so you, you can chew it nice and slow and not choke on what's being deposited. Amen. Anyway, let me go ahead and move forward. Without further ado, I know I just gave y'all my full. I'm stirred. I'm stirred. Y'all listen, I didn't get much sleep. So y'all know I'm just coming for it. I'm, I'm coming. I'm stirred. My sister didn't stir up the pot real, some real good. There's no residue that's sitting at the bottom anymore. It's all mixed in. Anyway, y'all catch that later. Anyway, without further ado, let us. My God, Lord Jesus, help me. Into who? Uh, let us welcome to the platform none other than Apostle Angelica. Apostle Angelica, uh, like I said, she wears many hats like other apostles do. We, we wear many hats. We oversee a lot of things. Uh, she's the co-laborer with her husband at Kingdom Life Empowerment Fellowship International. She is also the owner and CEO of her own clothing line called Angelic Design. Listen, y'all better visit her website after Uncut. Don't do it in the middle because you're going to miss the meat. Do it afterwards. She got some stuff. I got some things in my closet too, you know, and it's not your ordinary stuff. It ain't stuff that you can go in the store and find and then you turn around and you find somebody else wearing the same thing. You know what I'm saying? We like to be different, right? God called us to be set apart and even in our clothing, but we choose to, we, must, we choose to be a chameleon. Oh, anyway, let me, let me say the course. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, she, she is, as I said, she is the CEO of Angelic Designs. It's a clothing line that produces garments for clergy, ministry of movements, and then your everyday fashion wear for men and women, men and women and children. So you, you can't get no better than that, right? That's a one-stop shop where you can get all of it, right? She is also the founder of Fierce. I happen to, I just, I'm honored to be a part of that platform. Fierce is female in excellence, representing Christ effectively. Um, it is an international network of women. We focus on women empowerment, uh, community resolution and solutions, uh, family enrichment, and effective entrepreneur. I'll let her go on and tell you that. And the last but not least, she is also the co-founder of Kingdom Life Academy International, where I also serve as one of the instructors. I'm elated to say that because not everybody will welcome you to their platform to teach a thing. Right, y'all catch that later. Anyway, let us welcome Apostle Angelica. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm trying to hold it together. <laughs> y'all having a good day? <laughs> Mighty God. Listen, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Apostle Dr. Mack. I love you, love you, love you. Uh, thank you so much um, for allowing me the opportunity. I do count it an honor and a privilege to also be speaking next to these wonderful, dynamic women of God, uh, Dr. Akila Davis and Dr. Kinesia Mouton. They are amazing, amazing, amazing women. And let me tell you this, she just threw the perfect alley -oop. And I'm going <laughs> to keep flowing with it because she ended right where God had been talking to me about also. Whew. So I'm just like, just a big, big old baby right now. I'm like, God, help us today. This is, um, this uncut is definitely different. And, um, Father, have your way. Glory be to God. It's definitely different. And um, I want to share with you a few things before we um, get into the word. Um, one thing for certain is that we are entering into, yes, the year of manifestation. But just like she said, what's in you is going to come out. So you have to make sure that what's in you is worth value. Because if it's not, then it's still going to come out and you're going to just have a bunch of mess. 
And that was the best, best, best <laughs> description of what we are seeing even now is that what people have been trying to hold on to is what we are seeing come out. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for getting that at my throat. Because I can, I can, whew, I can go there. Whew, so while preparing and looking at um, looking at all of this, you know, looking at the word, looking at mending and binding, right? I like to go in and look at the actual physical application of what we are doing here. And um, then we're going to ship. I'm going to take some time. Um, whew, thank you, Lord. So mending, mending is to make something broken, worn, torn, or otherwise damaged whole, right? And the scripture that this is based off of says just that, right? Just so I make sure I don't misquote it. Y'all know it. Um, and we will, of course, continue to read it throughout this time. But it talks about he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, right? So looking at the, um, can y'all hear me well? I hope I'm, I'm, I'm loud enough, okay? Looking at the actual mending process um, physically on, on your body, um, whenever there is a cut, a, um, a scar, there is a way that your body will send off some messages and begin to start working on itself to fix the problem. Thank you, Lord. The thing about the natural way of healing itself, we have a very popular saying that says, time heals all wounds, right? <laughs> As a preacher, I'm inclined to say there's a problem in that text because it is the body's ability to actually function properly when sending off those messages that will allow time to heal the wounds, right? So there are arguably three to four different stages that happens when there is a cut made on the skin, right? Three to four different phases. Some doctors say three, some say four, some put them all together, some say five, right? I'm not going to go all into that because I, I hear you, Holy Ghost. I'm going to get to where I'm going. So during most of these phases, you have where, uh, well, during these phases, you, you will have where cells are being rushed to the site to begin the healing process. And it is amazing and fascinating to see that there is a program, a protocol or a system that our bodies go through to correct the damage that's been done. So when Dr. Akila was talking about the young man that got his hand cut, there was a system that was put in place, but the cut was so big and so large that it began to send too much to the site to where he couldn't keep the blood in, right? <sighs> Jesus, go with, go with me really quickly just so I can come back to ground one. I need to come back for just a second. Go with me to 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11 is what we're going to read. I'm gonna go there as well because 1 Peter chapter five. Thank you, Lord. I like to read from the Amplified for teaching purposes. 
to be sober, well-balanced and self-disciplined, be alert, cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You do not suffer alone. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of great, the God of all grace, who imparts his blessing and favor, who called you to his own eternal glory in Christ, will himself complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. To him be dominion, power, authorities, sovereignty forever and ever. Amen. That's where I want y'all to focus in on, okay? Because talking about, and I'm going to get to that scripture in just a second, talking about the process that the, the flesh goes through in order to heal itself and the stitches and the sutures that have to be done to correct the damage, there's something that God wants us to focus on even the more. And it also has a system and a protocol and a program in which it operates to help us to sort of heal on our own from cuts and backstabbing and wounds and trauma. And that's your mind. When you have a traumatic event happen and something uh, causes an adverse effect to you emotionally, your brain sends up, it, it sends out all of these hormones and everything to overcompensate. And then at the same time, shut down certain areas of your brain so that you are able to cope until you are free from danger or trauma. This particular concept and process reminds me of one of my favorite movies. And I, I am a creative and creative things spark Holy Spirit. Like, you see how they use that? So one of my favorite movies is actually an animation. It's called Kung Fu Panda, y'all, okay? And Kung Fu Panda, the second one, I don't know if y'all got any kids or grandkids. I have four. Kung, Kung Fu Panda, the second one. I, listen, I bore them to death because I have to watch it over and over and over again, the whole trilogy. But on this particular second one, the big fat panda, Poe, has become one of, he, he has become the dragon warrior, right? And so he is beginning to train for another level. And he is told at the beginning of this training that it took his master or teacher many, many years before he could uh, accomplish it. And Paul's like, okay, what is it? Tell me, tell me, tell me. And so in between him getting this instruction and him learning and beginning this journey, which is supposed to take him years and years to overcome, right? He gets interrupted with a battle that he has to go and fight and it throws off the whole training. So he thinks, but what happens is that he comes across an enemy that he does not know, but yet this enemy has targeted him. This enemy remembers him. This enemy has history with his mom and dad and ancestors and siblings. And so he's, he's still going on. He doesn't have a clue. He's just trying to fight and beat this person. And he's just all gung-ho, right? The thing about it is it takes for him to encounter 
this enemy face to face. They are up close now. And when he gets up close to this enemy, he gets a vision or a visual of a symbol and it triggers his memory to come back. And now he has this thought like, wait a minute, you know what happened to my parents. You know what happened to me in my past. And this enemy is like, yeah, now I got you. And he uses that to damage him severely. Long story short, because I'm feeling that some of y'all are like, I've never seen Kung Fu Panda. The thing of it is, as he is close to death and dying, he gets brought back to life by this, I don't even know what, a soothsayer is what they call her. And she begins to instruct him to face what he was seeing in that vision when, when he was triggered. And at the end of it, he learns what the teacher was trying to teach him through processing and going through the trauma. There is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And what many of us don't realize and understand is that our childhood trauma and things that we experienced while being young has truly affected us. It has damaged some neurons and has shrunken some glands and has uh, restricted areas in our mind to keep us from going where we ought to go. And as I was playing, as I was writing all this out, Holy Spirit allowed me to remember an instance at the beginning of, of my marriage where I am not used to being by myself at all. I grew up, I'm number seven out of nine kids. So it was always a loud house, moved in with three sisters and then got married. So I wasn't used to being alone. And my husband had to travel a lot. And I would be angry and so upset because I felt that him not being there was his way of saying that he wasn't really feeling me. Oh, I'm just trying to help y'all out because it came up. And so God allowed me to remember how it felt when I didn't know when he would be home because we were really young. We were in our twenties, couldn't keep a cell phone on, uh, going from house to house. And so there was times where I didn't know when he would be home. We didn't, we didn't have a car. So we had to rely on people and they was, folks would say they was going to bring him home, but they, they liked to kidnap my husband. And I was young. And at that time I was pregnant. So there was this facing of something and I didn't know what it was. And I'm like, God, why do I hate to be alone? I don't like to be by myself. Where is this coming from? What is this? And it took about a few years until I realized when my birthday would come around, my dad would, uh, would tell me the same story over and over and over again. And he would say, hey, when you were born, you swallowed some meconium. And so they had to keep you and we had to leave the hospital. And you were the only one that we had to leave. And it clicked. So wait a minute. This is from way back then, from birth, where the seed was planted, where I was left alone. I'm the only one that didn't get the connection with the family early on in those first early days. I'm the only one that didn't, I didn't mesh with everyone. 
Then shortly thereafter, here comes my, my baby brother and he celebrated. To this day, I can tell you that there are childhood friends of my family who believe that I was the next door neighbor's child that they were bringing to church. And that rejection kept piling up and piling up. That feeling of being alone kept piling up and piling up until it was like, okay, God, I got to be okay with who I am. I've got to be okay with what you've called me to be. And here we are with wounds. Here we are as children. I'm, I'm gonna lay it out like this. We go over family's house, family comes over. And as a child being touched, molested, raped, oh, I know it went on. And I speak out and tell my kids, I know what it looks like and this is what you should know too. We don't go spending the night over every family's house. We don't go over auntie and or uncle's house because although they may be Christian, although, although they may be professing the name of Jesus, what they like to do in the midnight hour is not godly. The way that they handle your young is not the way that it should go. And I can say this because I'm a product of that myself, not understanding and not knowing what was going on, not realizing that this was causing trauma repeatedly to my mind, to my self-esteem, to how I felt about myself. You couldn't tell me that I looked good about 10, 15 years ago because I was struggling. Something is always wrong. Some, something needed to be worked on. And it wasn't necessarily what was on the outside, it was what was on the inside. The cut was on the inside. I was still bleeding on the inside. It was still festering on the inside. Every time something happens, Every time something comes up, I'm thinking about it. I'm reliving it. I'm allowing the, the, those emotions to overtake me and to come over me and to allow me to be back in that moment, feeling small, feeling inadequate, feeling unworthy. And we do it so often. And we do. We try to cover it up. Oh, this one's acting out. They going out sleeping around. They going out having homosexual relationships. They don't like to dress like a woman. If you, they're a man, they don't like to dress like a man. Why, 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 why? Because we haven't dealt with the wound. It's still open and it was cut on. It was punched. It was scratched. It was scraped open. It wasn't allowed to scab over for years and for years. We had to keep going through it at every family reunion. We had to keep going through it at every single event that you were made to go to and smile and hug people and look at people and say, oh, I love you. And you didn't have a care in the world for that person. There were times in our lives where we were traumatized and we neglected it. And what did our brain do? Our brain tried to tell us that it didn't happen. Your brain would try to tell you that you don't remember that. It doesn't exist. But God is saying, I need you to deal with that. 
let me, let me help you out with why. Because for the thing, the things that happen inside of your brain, not only does your, does your glands release hormones, stress horm hormones that stimuli, making you relive the stressful e event over and over again, the continuous secretion of stress hormones can cause your what is called hippocampus to shrink in size. And that's the gland that's responsible for memory and emotions. That's why you can't control yourself. And although we're looking at this from a medical standpoint, hear Holy Spirit, because many of us, we look for drugs to take care of some, some things. And God is saying, I want to deliver you holy, where you won't need to alter your chemicals, but I will give you what is necessary to replace what was lost. Trauma can cause your amygdala, right? Which is this gland that is responsible for your creativity and survival and emotional thoughts as well. It goes into overdrive. That's why some, some kids turn to drawing and doing things. You wonder why you, you, you like to paint, you like the color, you like to play video games, you like to play Candy Crush, you like to decompress all the time. And it's because we haven't been dealing with the actual issue. allowing you to misplace and not have control over your emotions. You're irrational, irrational, excuse me. Then the enhanced amygdala function suppresses the prefrontal cortex that means after the traumatic event, you can't control your, your emotions. Your fears are outrageous. You fear a lot more and you're stuck in a reactive state. It can also reduce the hippocampus, the hippocampus function, excuse me, from being able to distinguish from past and present. So we just talked about some things that happen naturally. Let's take it spiritual for a moment. Because we all came into the body of Christ and we got saved. And those who were in charge of our souls might have mistreated us and abused us in the beginning or misled you or violated your trust, took advantage of you, hurt you, backstabbed you, made you feel less than. At some point or another, every single person experiences what we consider church hurt. And the air quotes is for the word church because it's, the body shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> the real body of Christ shouldn't be doing that. But we've experienced these things, these emotions where we didn't quite understand. And it was in this adolescent state of being a young babe in Christ in, 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 in which we have sustained damage. And it causes us to every single time we encounter a believer, we have to put them through this litmus test to make sure 
they not gonna treat us the way we were treated. We gotta go back in our minds and make sure that we can trust people um, and not what God is really telling us to do. Because if God told you to make the connection, you should just make the connection and do what needs to be done and then keep it moving. But instead we take this, this slow drag out time to actually connect with people the way that we should. And thus the body of Christ is slow on things. We don't get things accomplished anymore. Why? Because you over there with them and he over there with, 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 with them and they don't want to be connected. They don't believe that you're saved. They don't, and you don't believe that they're saved and you don't believe that they got power and they don't believe that you got power. And this whole thing has really come into a downward spiral of believer against believer. And now on the wound, and the cut has been applied to the body of Christ. And we've gone from inflicting wounds to one another to now having the body of Christ look decrepit. Like we can't handle anybody. We can't handle new people. We can't handle babes anymore. We can't handle bringing new people into Christ because we've, we've just taken advantage We just use them up. And the thing about it is that all of this over-processing and under-processing and not being able to get over what has actually been done the right way has caused us to stunt our spiritual growth. You can't make it past the last season. You're in a cycle. Why? Because you're still reliving the trauma. Some of you in the natural, what my mama did to me, what my daddy did to me. Some of you in the spiritual, what my spiritual mama did to me, what my spiritual daddy did to me, whether it was your pastor, saint, or friend, whatever or whomever caused a scar or a wound to come, you blame them and in your blaming them and reliving, you can't tell whether it was last season or next season or the season to come, what God spoke, when was the last time God prophesied to you and didn't have to speak through anybody else or when was the last time that you actually encountered the presence of God and you get confused because I can't tell whether it's night or day because I'm still living in the past, I'm still living that over and over and over again. And God is like, I'm just trying to grow the body. I want my body to be mature. When can we move on to maturity? But instead, like she said, we gotta go get prayer the same things what is it what is it about you having to go back to those same types of relationships maybe it's you trying to undo what had been done by thinking that you can fix the situation by going back to the same type of man or going back to the same type of relationship going back to listen there was a season where I had to say goodbye to my family, my natural family. And God had to slowly bring them back one by one till I knew who I was. Just like Moses, where he took him to the backside of a desert. Some of you need to make sure that you go into that moment of shutdown because he can't reveal you if you're still the same. There's no reveal necessary. There's no point. You just played hide and seek. That was it. And so when, when we don't have the ability to move past those traumas, those issues, and truly walk in, as Kung Fu Panda put it, inner peace, right? <laughs> the thing is, we believe that that inner peace is supposed to come 
from us because we didn't forgave everybody. And that's a blessing. But let me tell you something. Forgiving people don't always take away your memory. So what is it that you need? What is it that we're supposed to gain? How are we supposed to shift? Because when I say I forgave them, every time I see them, I still got to forgive them. They need a fresh forgiveness. Instead of new mercies, I see new forgiveness, I see. Because we, we're going back and forth trying to bind up our thoughts. Why? Because we haven't really dealt with it. We haven't really dug it up all the way and remembered everything. Scripture says that confession brings healing. And if you keep trying to hide it from God, who knows it already? Where's your healing? Being made whole. Being in a place where we can really smile. We can really have the joy of the Lord. Jesus, help me today. Let me, let me try to get back on track. Because y'all know I'm, I'm, I'm good about, <laughs> Jesus, let me find my place. Romans chapter 12, verse two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Good, acceptable and perfect. I understand there's nothing perfect about what you went through. I understand that you don't like the way it made you feel. I get it. But realize this, that God allows everything, not causes, allows everything to work together for your good. It works together. Colossians 3 and 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Our mindset and how we think we can no longer look at television, social media, what's going on around us to think as though we got a standard from the world. Sister already said it, our, our protocol, where we get things from should come from the word of God. It should come from the father. When we switch over, we no longer think like the world. Let me tell you this, when things happen, when situations come up, check your response because if it's not a godly res response, it's probably a worldly one. I know that goes against everything because we like to say like, like my mama did, I tell my kids more about what, what my parents did than actually do what they did. I'm trying to raise prophets and boy, is it hard. <laughs> it's a difficult thing. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 are moving quickly. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We like to put up walls and to block people from getting in 
but that's not what this scripture says. The scripture says the peace of God will guard our hearts, not you yourself, not you faking it, the peace of God. When you don't be anxious about everything and then you get the peace of God, the peace of God is the fence that guards your heart. One of my favorites, finally, brothers, Philippians 4 and 8, what, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's hard to do when you experience trauma. But when that comes up in your mind, don't ruminate on it. Don't dwell on it. Go, go through your biblical checklist of what you should be thinking about. And establish a line, a plumb line. Establish a standard of your thought pattern. Why? Because God's in there trying to do some work on what's been going on. Because there's a lot of things that are jacked up right now. And believe it or not, it's going on on the inside of us. Because he wants us to grow. To grow and be mature. And not have to go back and relive where he brought us from. Amen. I don't know how much time I have left, but I want you all to definitely think about the promises of, of God and what he has said as he is cutting you to pieces because he's going to keep on cutting you and reminding you of traumas so he can let that pus ooze out so you can get some proper salve and an anointment. You want to be anointed? Go, go, go through this next stage willingly. Amen. <laughs> Amen. She said anointment. Did y'all catch that? Did y'all catch that? Anointment. Yes. I think that went over some of y'all's head. But anyway. <clears throat> Again, she all up in the business, all up in the notes, all up in the everything. We didn't got stirred some more. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have y'all hold on to your seats. We're gonna take a 10 minute break. And within the break, this is an opportunity for you to give. Uh, listen, yes, we might be sitting in, in front of our respective home, sitting at our respective homes in front of everything, but it is still time right? Ministry needs to move forward. It costs to do ministry, M-I-N, not M-E-N. Um, it costs to do ministry. And the money that is sown, it goes right back out into the community because I believe ministry is out on the, on the outside of the four walls. But here's the interesting thing. We can't really see ministry and do ministry on the outside of the four walls if we are stuck licking our wounds. So I'm going to give us 10 minutes. I'm going to put on the screen where you have the opportunity to sew. And when we return, I will introduce the next speaker of the hour. Don't lose your page where you started writing them notes because you're going to need them to correlate. You're going to have to, you're going to need them to connect dots because it's important that when you're taking notes that you fill in the gaps. Y'all going to catch that. That there be a flow in what right. you're writing. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Are y'all enjoying yourselves? Are you, get, are you receiving something for yourself? Not for somebody else, but for yourself. I'll give it a few more minutes.
Wait till I see my next speaker. Oh, she is back. Amen. Thank you, guys. I speak blessings over your seed that has been sown. And may the Lord return unto you 100 fold that he will breathe on everything concerning you and your household that you lack absolutely nothing. And instead, we decree and declare checks in the mail, deposits in your bank account, cash apps, Zales, Venmos, and yes, even PayPal's to supply every single need known and unknown. God, we bless your name and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. The meat is good. We on steak number three now. No offense to those of you who don't eat beef, but we on steak number three. Listen, I'm full. I don't know about y'all. I'm in overflow right now. And it's like, okay, what else we got? <laughs> what, 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 what else, right? What else do we have? And so I want to, I'm trying to give everybody an opportunity to come back in the room. Um, you know, it's interesting. I ain't trying to be funny, but um, I did a teaching A couple of days ago, God gave me another revelation <clears throat> concerning him and his relationship with Noah. I know this is a little bit different. I'm just, I'm just, um, you know, taking up a little time just to make sure everybody's back in the room. But Apostle Keila said something very, very key. <clears throat> when she made reference to the young man at her job about how he got cut and the extent of his wound as a result of him not following instructions. And the only reason why I'm saying this is because it keeps dropping in my spirit and it has been dropping in my spirit even the more over the course of the last several days. Right. And so in my time of studying, the Lord illuminated on another level about the importance of us saints. And I say that very loosely, uh, but profoundly, um, the importance of us following instructions. Um, he gave Noah very specific instructions on how to build the ark. Now we've all read that story probably a gazillion times, right? But why not read it again? Because every time you go back and you read the scripture again, he gives you yet another level of revelation. And this time he made me pay attention. I'm going somewhere with this. This time he made me pay very close attention to the details of the instructions that were given to Noah. You said, well, what does this have to do with uncut? It has everything to do with uncut, mending the wound. Why? Because if we don't follow the instructions that are given to us, it is nearly impossible for the wounds to be mended. If you think about the story of Noah, uh, when God gave him instructions to build this ark, he was very specific in the type of wood that he wanted him to purchase. He was very specific about the measurement of what he gave him when he was building this ark down to how many levels how many openings and how many doors. And I said to the ladies in the ministry, I said this because it was a question that I had. It was a rhetorical question in my time of writing. And I said, you know what? I said, God, if Noah had a deviated from your instructions, even down to, and who else mentioned it? Apostle 
Angelica mentioned it even about sometimes we have to let go of family. God gave Noah very specific instructions on who to bring on and who to let go. I want to just mention about the wood because the wood, he told him to get cypress wood. And if he would have got press wood or some other kind of wood or makeshift wood, do you not know that ark would not been able to sustain 150 days worth of flooding of water? Because Noah decided, well, I don't have $25 per plank to buy cypress wood. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go buy me some plywood instead. I want to go the cheaper route. Not only would that ark would not have been able to withstand that amount of water for 150 days, he would have cost, it would have cost him the life, his life, his wife's life, his three sons' lives, his three sons' wives' lives, and all of the animals and the food that God told him to bring on that would sustain him during the time, the course of time that they were shut in. You say, well, what are you saying? I'm glad you asked that question. When we don't take the time to follow the instructions to the T that are given to us, we can't mend the wound. We can't get to the root of the matter. And what we end up doing is we bleed all over everybody and we become contaminated. So my prayer for you is that you take heed to the notes that you're writing, that you're not just scribbling on a piece of paper, that you're really taking heed to what is being deposited into you don't think about when you write them notes, oh, you know what, this is for my husband, or this is for my child, or this is for my grandma and them, or this is for my ace boom cool, my friend, my BFF. No, take that information for self. Because you can't help those people that you're saying it's for unless you get the help yourself. Follow the instructions. There's been a lot of instructions that have been given so far. A lot of instructions. It's been a whole lot of instructions. If you if you got to do like me, I got several colors of uh, 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 highlighters. I got several different colors of pens because that's how I keep notes. That's how when I write things in different colors, that's like an aha moment to me. Oh, this stuck out to me. However, whatever tickles your fancy. The point of, um, that I'm trying to make is follow the instructions. Take the information. Don't just take it and then close the notebook at the end of the day and sit it on the shelf. Take that information and begin to digest it. Ask the father, okay, Lord, I am become overwhelmed with all of this information that I received today. And I know that it's helping me to do a self-reflection. Father, I'm inviting you in to help me do this assessment. Give me a strategy. Give me a boldness in my strategy so that I confront, I can confront the foolishness that I have been playing around with, these cycles that I've been continuing to go because I'm tired of being the hamster on the wheel. Follow the instructions. I promise you, when you follow the instructions and you partner with Holy Spirit and whomever God has appointed to be your covering. You'll come out on the other side. Time is of the essence. Amen. I got that out the way because it was sitting in my chest. Whew, glory. Now, on to number next. I'm trying to figure out how to introduce this woman of God because if I may just take a moment. You guys don't understand. And yeah, I'm going to go there. Thank you, Lord, because somebody needs to hear it. 
Listen, we talking about wounds. We talking about all of this stuff, right? We talking about, you know, the wounds that we've encountered, wounds from our past, wounds from generational proclivities, the wounds that we started and we created, all of these things never, nonetheless, we need somebody to help walk us through, right? And I'm saying all this to say, this woman of God that I am about to introduce has been very influential in my life, right? I had the opportunity to sit at some influential leaders, global leaders. Um, I will not mention their names, um, but I had the opportunity to be imparted into for a period of time. Prior to moving, transitioning here to Texas, and I will say this, I was in ministry, y'all, very active in ministry, and I was still broken. I brought my wounds with me from California to Texas. It's like they had their own luggage. But the one thing I can say is the people who carried me prior to gave me some tools. I didn't buck against them. I didn't clap back to them. Even when I did not want to hear the truth. This is real talk, right? Is this uncut? And so when I moved here, I was broken. My marriage was broken. See, I'm not afraid to say that because we on the other side of that. Amen. I was broken. Personally, I was broken. As a leader in ministry, I was broken. I was still struggling with my identity. See, uh -huh, that's a whole nother conversation right there. And I began to pray out to God. I said, Lord, you know that prayer we all pray, God, send me somebody. Send me somebody who going to love on me, who going to help me. Don't get it twisted. My mother was in my life. She was in my life. But my mother was broken too. The area that I needed nurturing in, she couldn't nurture me because she was broken in the same area. So here I was sitting in this women's conference. I think it was about 60 women in the room. We were packed to capacity and actually we were actually violating a fire code because we it was too many of us in the room. And Apostle Kinesia Mouton, um, at that time she was, Dr. Dr. K is what a lot of, that's what I heard in the room. She was one of the panel speakers. I was on duty, if you will, in ministry, here we go. In ministry, I was on duty. I was helping with the altar call. Truth be told, I needed to be on the altar. Uh, but see, that's a whole nother topic. And at the end of the program, they did an altar call. There was about seven facilitators, I guess, and they were all praying for one another. And here I am, I'm holding a box of tissue, helping the people. Here you go, here's your tissue, I'm, I'm serving. But every now and then, as she's ministering to the other people, we would lock eyes. And then she kept doing what she was doing. I kept doing what we were doing. And we would lock eyes. Remind you, I was broken. When it was all said and done, all the people out of the room, and it was apostles sitting there, prophetess sharing her armor bearer standing there, and she looking at me and I'm looking at her. Now, mind you, I'm several feet from her. And it was like, the Lord was like, just go. Ain't never seen a woman before in my life. She didn't know nothing about me. But when I tell you, when Holy Spirit steps in and he begins to answer your prayer that you need, you said you need somebody, I'm going to send you the person you need, not the one you want. Did y'all hear what I said? He sends the one that you need, not the one that you want. You looking for somebody to dress like you, talk like you, smell like you, and I hope you smell good, by the way, um, and, you know, eat like you and do all of these kinds of things. 
but that's not what God wants for you. He provides you with what you need. And so I began to slowly walk up to her and she read my book, my book of life. She read my book of life and she probably don't remember, remember all of this. I remember it. And the reason why I remember is because I, I cherished that moment almost eight years ago. Actually, this is March, eight years ago. It was eight years ago, new beginnings. And this woman heard the voice of God and she began to regurgitate my life story. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Truth be told, I kind of ran from her afterwards because I was like, she all up in my business. I don't even know this woman. She gave me her phone number. And she said, please call me. And I waited for about a week and then I called her. She didn't answer her phone. And I was like, yes. And she turned around and called me. And from that day forward, she has been a very influential person in my life. She is one who has spoken truth to me, even when I didn't want to hear it. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. Even when I didn't want to hear it. When I continued to have the struggles in my marriage, she was right there by my side. She rebuked me on the areas of what I, no, you need to, no, don't say that. Mm -mm. Don't, no, don't do that. You know, whatever the scenario is, whatever I needed in that moment, God saw fit to minister to her and through her to give me what I needed. And she plays a very key part of who I am today. God first, God first. And because she listened to the voice of God, she pulled me out of the corner that many other leaders put me in. She pulled me out of a box that my family put me in. See, I mentioned the whole family thing for a reason. She helped me to cultivate my own identity. I was starting to come into my own, but I was still struggling in areas. And the areas that I was struggling in was because of what other people said. I'm talking about people who have authority over me. People who told me I wasn't nothing. I could not say nothing. I didn't have anything to say. I wasn't going to be nobody. You stay right there in that corner. That I was incompetent. You going to tell me I'm incompetent and now I hold a doctorate degree? Really? They don't just give doctor degree at the school I went to. You got to do the work. I'm not boasting from a place of arrogance. I'm boasting about the things of God. She has stretched me beyond comfortability, even on the phone call last night. But anyway, I want to introduce to you guys one I call my spiritual mother, my covering. She has been covering me. Even when other people try to uncover me, she makes sure the sheet is fitted. So I want to introduce to some and present to others, Dr. Kinesia Mouton, also known as the pusher. The platform is yours. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, daughter, for the honor that um, you just, you know, gave to me. I don't take that lightly because I don't care what role I play. I want to be where God wants me to be. And I want to be to whom I'm assigned to that that I'm supposed to be. So I'm just honored. I, that's the best way I could put it. I'm just honored that he would entrust me with his assignments because we have to realize our assignment is his assignment. It's his agenda. And so when he looks upon us and he says we're worthy enough to take on a certain role in a person's life, we ought to not count that lightly. And what people fail to understand, and I say this all the time before I get started, when people tell me what I've been to them, I have to remind them that it's what you've been to me that helps me be what I am to you. And what I mean by that is when you realize the capacity of your responsibility in a person's life and you really honor who the father is in your life, it keeps you on your face. 
it keeps you in his presence because you don't want to mess somebody else's destiny up or their weight onto their destiny because you don't want to be the reason. You don't want to be the one that the Bible talks about that can be the reason that you cause another man to stumble. Come on, somebody. And so we have to, as leaders, also let those that we lead know you're just as important to me as I am to you, because it's because of you that I keep saying, look here, Lord, whatever they see in me, you better let it be real. Don't you let them see something that's not really there and draw them here. And I'm empty when they get here, because that's a hurtful feeling. I've been there. I've been one that sat up under leadership and they could not give me what I needed. They couldn't help me get where I am today. And I had to be seated under different people to catch Y'all get that. I, I, it wasn't that they taught me stuff. I had to catch things. It, it's like everything that I've ever gotten, I always had to go through it in a vicarious way. It always had to be done differently. You know, you couldn't just sit down and just teach me something. I had to be in positions where I had to catch mantles. I had to be in a place where I would receive the overflow or the downpouring. And, and it was a reason why God did that purposely so that no man could take credit for what he was doing. And I could never give man more credit than what they deserve. Y'all need to catch that because we cannot idolize our leaders. We can love them immensely, but we should not idolize them because there's only one true living God. And if that leader is not in a relationship, a committed relationship and faithful in the relationship with the almighty God, then you need to check your place of residency because that is not, you're never supposed to be led to the leader. You're supposed to be led to the God that leads the leader. Amen. So I, I do honor you, daughter, because you are a phenomenal woman of God, an apostle in her own right. And even when you got uh, what people don't know, there were those that even questioned when I commissioned her. They literally out of their mouth asked me, did you really hear God? when you commissioned her and then had the audacity to tell her that they asked me that question. And so that's when you know, when you really call to do something, because if I wasn't, you wouldn't have to question it. You would just say, well, that's them people. If she commissioned her and she ain't supposed to be commissioned and that's between them and God, but I'm gonna go on my business. But the fact that you took out time to ask the question lets me know that you already know and she's in a place where you're trying to be, but God has not authorized you to be so. So y'all, I, I tell you, <laughs> people don't know the story. I know Angelica and I know Apostle, um, Akila can attest to it. People don't know this journey. It's not cookie cut. It's not just to get here and, and be cute on Zoom with you. And, and oh my God, we go through some warfare. <laughs> we have hell trying to blow through the roof and the windows of our home while we trying to rein in your stuff. So it is by no means a fairy tale process, but we bless God because we understand that if he thought we were worthy enough to imprint us in a position position as such, to give us the ability to handle the warfare that comes with it, then we got to know we serve a mighty God and we are mighty women of God that have set aside the time to invest in our spiritual makeup to make sure that we're in a place that God can use us. So I applaud all of you ladies. Even those that are not apostles on here, the prophets, the evangelists, the teacher, the administrator, the help ministry, whatever way you serve, I give hats off to you because we are all needed and ain't none of us better than the other. Amen. So with that being said, let's get down to the nitty gritty. I'm going to try to cut through some of this because I got notes for days, but he gave them to me early this morning. So y'all get to get it fresh because I did not go to sleep till 5 a.m. after I woke up at 9 p.m. So <laughs> I took me a good little three-hour nap and I've been up ever since. I was even trying to log on an hour early to the doggone Zoom thing. And I'm sitting there like, why is nobody else over here? And I looked at the thing and I say, maybe because it's 10 o'clock and not 11 o'clock. So yeah, I'm ready. But I just want to give hats out to Apostle Akila and Apostle Angelica because they both ran the runway. I mean, like, 
Apostle Angelica really was getting off into my stuff. And, and then Apostle Aquila, she was like the jackhammer hitting that ground, that, that asphalt, breaking up that fallow ground. Cause I mean, she was setting the foundation. Okay. So what I want to talk to you about um, and I need, I told my armor bearer to help me with time, but just in case I'm not looking, Apostle uh, uh, Mac, Dr. Mac, if you would help me as well. But what I want to dig into is what Uncut is all about and what mending the wound looks like. And you kind of heard a little bit parts and pieces. But what I want to identify with, I'm one that when God brings me in to teach, I love to deal with the person. Because a lot of times we love to project our issues everywhere else and put our attention everywhere else. But the primary suspect is us. If we are not an active participant in our own deliverance and healing, everything else is to not. It doesn't even matter. I can pray for you all day long. I can cast demons out of you all day long. But if you don't participate in your own healthiness, in your spirit, man, it does not even matter. Everything is irrelevant. So that's the base that I always start with is dealing with self. And so in the process of preparing for uncut, I think it was Apostle Aquila said it was like an oxymoron, uncut, mending the wound. I said, now, wait a minute. If it ain't cut, it says uncut. I'm analytical. So, you know, when you deal with analytical people, we are verbatim, line for line, precept upon precept, okay? So I'm looking at saying it's not cut, but yet it's a wound. So I say, okay, Father, talk to me. And what he told me, he said, uncut means you're dealing with what has not been circumcised. Something that has a wound effect and it has not been touched, but the things that have not been addressed create the wound. So when it's uncut, it may not be a wound that everybody else can see, but it can be felt by the one that's wounded. I said, wow. So the uncut mending the wound is the things that you have not circumcised in your life, the things that you have not cut off. The very things that are still an attachment to you, hanging on to you, and it's wounding you, but you have not identified it as a wound because you can't see it, but you can feel it. And I know all of us have been there where we like, Lord, is something going on with me, and I just can't put my finger on it. It's like, Ugh. you go to the doctor, and they do all these diagnoses, and they, I mean, not diagnosis, all these uh, procedures to find a diagnosis. They do x-rays, EKGs. They do all of this stuff, but none of it shows up on the man-made material. Why? Because it's a deeper wound that cannot be picked up or detected by the natural aspect because it's something that needs to be cut off. It's something that needs to be circumcised that man can't do for you. It's something that only God can do. But you got to be in a place to be the patient that God can be the great physician for. So that's what we're going to come from the angle of in the medical perspective of things, because I started searching for things in the medical terminology that parallel with things in the spirit. And I was like, ah, so I even needed some of this stuff for myself. I just shared with Apostle Michelle that even Thursday when I was in a room full of billionaires and millionaires, I felt myself going back to the days of old when I used to shrink in the room with women before I found who I was. And I used to feel that shrinking feeling and I'd be like, okay, well, I'm irrelevant and they're all this and that and I'm going to just get over here and be out the way because nobody knows who I am and I'm not as important as they are. I'm just being transparent. I had that moment on Thursday and it was some things that God was saying, I need you to still circumcise. Hello. And it wasn't until this morning when he gave me this word did it make sense as to what I told her and was speaking to her about that took place with me on Thursday. So this is what I want you to understand. When you are called to minister the word of God, it better minister to you first. You cannot release something that you have not engraved into yourself, that you have not embraced for the place in which you are. And nine times out of 10, every assignment is allocated to what God is doing in you first. So you can be the living example to those that you're getting ready to minister it too. So I have no problem admitting to things when I have my, my shortcomings and my fallings, because why? I want it to be a building block, my stumbling block to be a building block for you. I want you to pick that thing up in your life and say, okay, well, if the apostle can handle it, guess what? I can too. The same God, same love, same compassion, same deliverance, 
same healing is available on all levels. Amen. Has nothing to do with our title. So where I want to talk to you about, we know that the sin, we know abuse, neglect, rejection, betrayal, all those things come in and they attack us emotionally. Uh, we get pain and hurt from those things. Just like we feel physical pain, we feel spiritual pain. And Jehovah is our great physician that can completely heal the broken heart, bind our wounds, heal us and make us whole. We know that from the scripture of 147 Psalms and verse three, right? But I want to propose to you Psalms 34, 17 through 22 real quickly. Because we got to have scripture to guide our heart and our mind towards the full recovery that we're looking for when we're dealing with wounds, amen? And so it reads, and I'm going to be giving you the, uh, I think this is the New King James Version. I forgot to put my version on here. I apologize because I got like four Bibles laid out on my bed, on my desk here. So I apologize. But I think this is the New King James Version part on the paper here. But anyway, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Now, I thought it was interesting that the Lord allowed me to run across that scripture and bring that up in my spirit to share with you. And the significance of that is having a wound can be condemned. That's what helps us to stay in that spiral effect of going around and around the same issue over and over and never recognize it. Because when you become condemned, that means your mind is locked away from truth. Your mind is locked away from being able to receive repentance, forgiveness from the Lord because you don't even think you're worthy enough to be forgiven. You don't think you're loved enough to be brought into a better place. So condemnation can be the very result of the wound. The wound can cause you to feel condemned because you feel like, Lord, I'm going through this. I'm dealing with that. Those of us who have been molested, raped, uh, violated in some form or fashion, rejected, abandoned, all those things make you feel what? You feel condemned. Before God came into your life and introduced you into a new way, you felt like this is just a way of life. I know for me, I felt like my purpose in life was for other people to drop their issues off on me, wipe their feet on me as the doormat of life and keep moving. I was taking in everybody else's issues and insignificances while they went on about their business. And I'm sitting over here going through, why me? Why is this this way? Why can't I be loved? Why am I not accepted? Why, 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 why? So my womb, having that womb was condemning me. Condemnation means you're in a place where you cannot grow. You cannot move past the place that you're in because it's like a building. Think about a building when they condemn a building. They deem that building what? Unusable. It's no longer useful. So when the enemy brings condemnation upon us, then guess what? He's saying you're not usable. When we have wounds, we don't feel usable. We don't feel like God wants to do a great and mighty work through us. Why? Because I'm a wounded vessel. So today we just want to talk about what that looks like so that you can understand that your wounds are intended to be healed. But I believe part of the problem is, and I say this all the time, and many of you probably have heard it in my teachings, where I tell people we're so convinced that when we get deliverance, that's it. Deliverance is the protocol that gets us to the healing because you got to get into a place of being delivered from what you've been bound in. So now the unraveling can take place and you can get healed from the incident that took place because deliverance does not mean that you're just completely, totally out of the water. What it means is that the thing that once had control over your life, the thing that once had you bound and in a place where you could not move forward, you now have taken authority over it. You've now positioned yourself to be the one that stands up above that thing and overcomes it and says, I'm going to overthrow all the issues that came with it. I'm not going to surrender myself to that when I can do better, when God has 
said that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And I know that I can have a better expected end that is good and not of evil. So now I'm understanding these things and I'm getting this word. I have a mentor, I have a coach, I have a apostle, a prophet, a pastor, somebody in my life that's now feeding me. That's a part of all of your deliverance. Deliverance is not just you falling, you know, all out on the floor and foaming at the mouth and spitting up stuff. Deliverance just means that you are accepting the accountability and the responsibility that there is something wrong with you. Hello, somebody. That is the first part of deliverance. You got to first understand that there is a problem. And then people can maybe cast a demon out and all this other stuff because you've seen people cast demons out of people and it take a long time. Why? Because that person holding on to whatever that womb came with. They holding on and they, they, they're like, wait a minute, if you take this from me, I'm not going to be the attention at the altar anymore. I'm not going to be the one that everybody is petting on and say, oh, oh, you know, I'm here for you and constantly helping you pay bills or helping you get stuff that you don't need or helping you be a crutch to yourself. So, you know, a lot of times when you wrestle with those demons they don't want to come out and I tell God I say if this is my assignment give me the power let my hand be your hand let my mouth be your mouth let my abilities be your abilities but if it ain't mine because this person is not ready to let go then give me the wisdom to know how to just pray for them come in agreement with them love on them and keep it moving I'm not gonna sweat out my little hair and you don't want to come out I'm just saying we got to understand and and people will say well god has given all the ability to you know do deliverance not necessarily so because deliverance is the children's bread to receive it but to do deliverance you got to have wisdom too and you got to understand your areas of authority and you got to understand that those demons are only going to bow to the father they're not bowing to you so a lot of times you get theatrical affects going at the altar that these two demons are actually playing with each other. So everybody think the performance was real. And then the person still goes out because how can you go through a deliverance, but yet still desire the same foul thing that you said you gave up? The taste bud has to change in that deliverance. So these are the areas where we identify that people are wounded because they are repetitive altar breakers. Now, don't get it twisted. Like she said earlier, the altar is the place for us to go. But guess what? You don't have to wait till you get to the house of God to build an altar. You can build an altar in your home. I remember I built an altar in my closet before I was able to have a prayer room. And I had significant prayer points and things that I pinned with a little stick pin thing with postcards I use postcards like I mean they are my best friend I have all kind and I postcard to death I teach my people to do postcards put your scriptures on postcard I teach them how to remember scriptures by using postcards postcards are my friend so I would use postcards put my children name put the scripture that I'm calling out over their name and I will pin it to the thing I even put because I have five children I put a dollar offering and pinned it to each postcard and I put a seed on what I was asking God to do for my children amen and my husband and for my marriage anything that I had prayed for I will stick my little dollar on there and to this day them little seven dollars that I wind up sticking up on the walls is sitting on my table everybody look at them and they will not touch them dollars even though I've taken them down because now my seed is bigger because I need bigger movements. Y'all better hear me. And so, but them little $7, like literally I've been living here, what, four years now? Them dollars been sitting there for four years, <laughs> just sitting there and nobody ever touches them because it's sacred. And it's like, you don't even have to tell nobody, but you, you set up things in your home and you set up examples of things so people understand what you stand for and what you mean by what you do. But back to the mission at hand. So when we look at the fact that having a wound can be condemning to us, we have to identify people need to understand what true deliverance is. Like I said, it's not you just being able to come out of something, but what once had a control over you, authority over you, you now have control over it. Does not mean you will not be tempted by it possibly does not mean that it cannot come back and try to knock at your door but what it means is you will recognize it where at once you did not recognize it and then when you look at the word of healing you have to understand that healing is a process of making or becoming sound or healthy 
So that means even in the natural, because that's the natural definition of it, but that's also a spiritual definition. Because when we are being healed from our wounds, that means that we're in the process of making it and making it become sound or healthy, that area that we were injured in. Amen. And so what I want to talk to you is about a couple of things that the type of wounds that I told you I looked up and I thought it was really interesting. So there are several type of wounds, but I'm going to deal with the basic ones that I found and I thought, you know, we could relate to. Number one are abrasions. Abrasions. These are the form of wounds that result from rubbing or scraping the skin against a hard surface. Now, I want to talk to you in parallel of the spirit. When you bucking against systems and you bucking against authorities and you're bucking against things that you ought to be submitted to, when you bucking against your parents, when you bucking against leadership, when you're bucking against those that God has given authority over your life to help you, but instead because you're so proud, you're so prideful, you're so self-centered, you're so about you know your way or the highway that you won't hear and you won't adhere to the authority or the the wisdom that's trying to break in and come in and help you with some things so you keep bumping your head up against the same issues you keep dealing like somebody said earlier you still dealing with the same type of men i went there because i did it i used to wonder why was every man that i dated either had been in jail on his way to jail or one foot in and one foot out you know and i was like why is it that i'm ha because why because i was wounded and I was attracting wounded men because I felt like if I could be that woman in his life to show him I'm that ride or live chick or back then, because I say ride or live now, it's a habit, but ride or die chick back then. And yeah, ride or die because they was going to kill me off if I would have stuck with them. But if I was that ride or die chick in his life, he would remember me and he would be faithful to me and no other chick could come in and take my place because I was that chick for him. I would do whatever needed to be done to show him that I loved him, but I was not doing anything to show me that I love me and nor was he doing anything to show me the same thing so those are the abrasions because I kept rubbing up against the same type of stuff until the point where my skin got raw come on here my spiritual skin got raw because what I knew about God they began to pull me away from it okay we talking like Solomon remember you know Solomon was what the wisest man that had ever lived God had given him so much wisdom but he did the stupidest thing he told him if he took up on all those different concubines, all those different women, they were going to sway his heart away from him. They would sway him away from his God. But Solomon, because he's so wise, that's what I'm talking about when you think you know it all. Oh, your mama told him, he told you, oh, baby, I don't think he the right one. Or they might have said, that friend that you keep bringing around, I got a little question about her or him. You know, something ain't right. But you keep going and you keep going because you think you know better and you're so wise that you stupid. You so smart. Uh, my sister words, smart dummy. You're a smart dummy. You smart, but you do some dumb stuff. I was guilty. I was guilty. Had a head graduated on a society, 4.0 in college. I'm talking like top of the class and all of that, but was a smart dummy. Because I had so much book sense, I didn't have no common sense. So those are your abrasions. You keep rubbing up against the same old stuff. Got me three babies with three three different baby daddies and yeah, by myself. And I felt like that wound was here I am abandoned to raise a, 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 a family by myself. And I had the man, the last baby daddy tell me, you ain't gonna find no man that's gonna want you because you are already made family. Don't no man want that. But you will always be mine. What? while he walking out the door to go to the chick he left me to go be with. When you're wounded, you're stupid. Like I said, smart dummy. Smart, I could I could pick up on anything. You give me some Bible, a verse, or, or you give me some, some uh, out of an English book or whatever, I could write a paper, I could write a thesis, I could do uh, 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 anything that I wanted to do book-wise, educational-wise, but was dumb, and I'm gonna say it as all out of hell, in life. So those are your abrasions. When you just keep rubbing against the same old stuff and know you ain't gonna get no different result, but you just keep scratching yourself, just keep scratching yourself because all it is, it ain't hurt you enough 
to where you realize that it's going to cause a bigger wound later on. You're just getting the abrasion part of it. You're just scraping yourself. So, so you're just getting by. Amen. So then there's the lacerations. <laughs> I like them. The lacerations are the deeper cuts caused by sharp objects, such as a knife or a sharp edge. Now, these are your deeper wounds. The uh, deeper cuts, let me say that, your deeper cuts that cause bigger wounds, you know, it go beyond the surface. You're not just getting scratched on the surface no more. Now, these are stuff that like when you get molested by your father or your brother or somebody in your family left you and abandoned you after you had a relationship with them, you knew daddy and all of a sudden one day daddy moved out and he never came back or mama gave you over to the grandmother to be raised by her because she didn't want to have children or she didn't know how to have children or she might have had a mental illness or a drug habit, whatever the case was, those are cool. Those go deeper because they hit the heart area. That hit that, the, 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 the I'm not good enough for nobody to stay around area. Nobody really wants me and I'm not worthy of happiness and I'm not worthy to have a full life. And I believe that everybody else that I see having it, it can happen for them, but it won't happen to me. Those are what lacerations do to you. And those are deeper cuts. Those are deeper wounds that you have inflicted upon you through the sharp objects of life. That means those things in life that people use to cut you with. It could have even been the way they talk to you. Some of us have been in abusive relationships. You were beat for opening your mouth. You were beat for having an opinion. Those caused laceration type wounds because it went so deep down, it hit your character. Mm. Lacerations mess with your character because it goes down into who you are. It messed with the soul of who you are and it's already bypassed the spirit of what you are, because now you done had these abrasions. These abrasions have brought along other spirits that didn't even belong to you, stuff that you wasn't even having to deal with because you kept rubbing up against the wrong stuff and the wrong people, you start picking up their spirits. So now their spirits are attached to your spirit and now your spirit is wide open for the big cut. Amen? Punctures, I thought these were interesting, punctures. These are small yet deep holes caused by long pointed objects such as a nail. So this is when huh, things in life keep poking at you, keep reminding you of your shortcomings and your failures, keep reminding you where you came from, that you grew up in the poverty levels of the, the projects or that you didn't have this or you didn't have that, that, that you were uh, uh, born premature or you were, you know, just whatever it is that just pokes at you. It's that nagging wound that just like Thursday, when I walked in that room with all those billionaires and millionaires, though I know God had told me that that's what I was called to, the punctures, the little holes that had been poked in me to say you were never going to be nothing when you grow up, that you would never have anything, even though I've defeated the majority of everything that was spoken over me by the God's grace that is up on my life, but still there were punctures, the little holes, the ones that everybody else can't see, the ones that seep out. Oh, y'all better hear me. They seep out because they speak out. And they sound like, you know how something that has a little hole and it has that little sound in it when you blow in it. So it has a whisper to it and, and it speaks to you because it's leaking out, it's speaking out to you and reminding you of the little insignificant situations and circumstances that have intruded your life and caused you to feel some kind of way about yourself. That's the puncture wounds. Then there's the burns. Ooh, hey, my God, the burns. These are the result from contact with open flame, strong heat source, severe cold, certain chemicals or electricity in the natural. So let's look at that spiritually. <laughs> the open flames, 
when you go towards things that God has not called you to touch and you go and put your hands to stuff that he didn't tell you to do and you don't have the protective shield over you. So you hit your hand into that open flame and you get burned and then you blame your pastors or your leaders or your parents because it didn't work out the way you told that you thought it was or that you thought it should because I saw Michelle do it. And when I tried to do it, it didn't work the same way for me. So now I'm angry with everybody else instead of owning up to the fact that I was never supposed to stick my hand in that thing in the first place because I know I wasn't called to it. I know I didn't have the ability or the capacity to handle it, but I did it anyway because it looked good. It looked like a magic trick to me. Oh, come on here, somebody. I, I thought it was a magic trick. I thought if I just rub my hand like this and I turn around three times, I could still do what she did, but it don't work that way. So then you have this, this open flame womb. And so then the strong heat source, when you get close to things that God has warned you about or people have warned you about and you just still keep edging your way into that thing and you start feeling that heat and heat can burn you just like an open flame can because the heat is hot. It is the overcasting of the flame. So sometimes the heat will burn you before you touch the fire. And so these are the things that we deal with when we allow the enemy to entice us to go out and do things that we know we have no business doing. See, now you, you get close to stuff. Uh, 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 yeah, you might not be having sex, but you masturbate. Oh, did I go there? Okay. You might not be messing with the married man, but you holding a conversation with him at night when he should be laying next to his wife. Um, those are the areas where you start, I'm going to stop right there, <laughs> but those are the areas when you start getting close to the heat, you, you, you getting up on stuff that you ain't got no business and emit, you know, e eventually the flame will suck you in, it'll engulf you. And then you go from talking to him at night to sleeping to with him at night, or, or you go from masturbating to actually trying to get a booty call at, oh, okay. So you got to be mindful of those wounds that you have not, remember we said what was the uncut, it's the uncircumcised thing, the thing you ain't cut off yet, the thing you've not addressed yet because it felt good to pleasure yourself, but you didn't look at where it came from and what it's gonna do to where you're going or, 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 or even the lies that you tell to pump yourself up. Let's go there too. Cause we always talk about the sexual immorality, but what about the personal immoralities? Because you got liars in the body of, uh, uh, well, supposed to be in the body of Christ. People who lie about their accomplishments, they lie about the things that they can do or they lie about what God has used them in and that's not necessarily what has happened what they did was they took that mimicking spirit and they went and tried to mirror something that god did not anoint them for so now they are illegally operating in a place that god has not given them authorization so now they didn't got to the place where the heat is burning them now they want somebody to deliver them but nobody told you to get close to the fire like that because you know that you were not fire fire retardant you were not fire ready. You did not have the, 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 the Teflon on you that was going to protect you from the open flame because see, it's only in God do we get not burned because he is the Teflon that protects the content that's on the inside of us when the flame comes. Because see, the flame comes, it's like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. You can get in the fire, but you don't have to get burned. Because when you're called to God doing something in your life to make a display to others, to draw them to him, when you go through, you go through differently than everybody else. Your results are different, okay? But when you operating in a womb, you're trying to make a way for yourself. You're trying to make a name for yourself. You're trying to create a platform that your feet don't fit, okay? So avulsions, A-V-U-L-S-I-O-N-S. These refer to the partial or complete tearing away of the skin and the tissues. So y'all know how we used to talk about beating you till we see the raw meat or the white meat. These are the white meat type of situations or wounds that tear the skin completely off. And, and it refers to the partial tearing away or the complete. It could be partial or it can be complete tearing away of the skin and the tissue. And I heard in the spirit when I read this, the Lord say, this is the exposure part right here. When your flesh gets you in a position where it speaks about who you are and your character, 
So these are the wounds that you hidden for so long from everybody else. But then as soon as you get back in that corner, baby, that flesh tear open and it let the real you come out. Now you cussing folks when you was just speaking in tongues. Now you, okay. Now you have an attitude that's so funky and nasty that don't nobody want to be around you because now your flesh has exposed you. There's been a tearing away of the tissue and the flesh. So God had to get down to what was really on the inside of you because you kept hiding it from everybody else. Because you refuse to get healed. You, or you refuse to sit down somewhere and let somebody help you and cultivate you into a new place. So you were that, that, that wine skin that did not want to be transferred over into a new wine skin. And so you busted wide open. Oh. Because you tried to put the fervency, the, the capacity of all that you've been in and all that you've been doing behind closed doors, uh, 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 doing rituals, oh, God, rubble, shit cake, uh, doing uh, seances and, 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 and asking for powers from the darkness because you wanted to have certain ways to get into stuff. I don't even know where this is coming from, but you wanted to have ways to get into certain realms in the spirit illegally. There's that word again, being illegal in your process. And, and you did not want to go through the process. Let's talk about that real quick. You didn't want to sit at nobody's feet to get cultivated for what you're trying to do. So you just went and read a couple of books and you got some self-help tapes and you sat down and watched a couple of YouTube videos. And then now you said, I am now called to my international global ministry. And then the devils that you're trying to go out there and come against is a right... Mm. They recognizing you and they saying, you can't cast me out because me and you are of the same. So that's the tearing away. That's that wound that if it, it pulls the flesh back and it deals with the tissue. It deals with what you really made of. Because you refuse to get healed because you felt like you needed to fast track because, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. He even said those are the ones that deal with that are the ones that feel like life owe them something. Like somebody owes them something because of whatever they've been through. You still blaming your mama and your daddy for all the things that you've been through. And it's time for you to let that go because you've grown. You about 60 years old now. You need to let mama and them go. Whatever mama and them did or did not do, that's back then. You now have choices. You had choices when you got from around mama and daddy now. You had choices to be able to be released from those bondages and those strongholds and those imaginations, but you chose to wallow in them because you wanted to continually be the altar poster child you wanted to be the poster child for altruism you know they call they get they got a such thing as autism i'll make up words there's altruism that's the new mental illness is altruism because you got altruism it's not autism and i'm not making fun of autism i need you to hear me in the spirit but you got altruism because you're going to the altar, the A-L-T-A-R, but you're not allowing it to A-L-T-E-R your character. So you're just going up there so people can see you and people can run to you and people can woo-woo you. And that's why you got this avulsion taking place because now the skin and the tissue is being torn away because God said, I'm gonna get down to the bone and the marrow and I'm gonna deal with you. Amen. So chronic wounds can also cause breakages in the skin that need to be healed. These include bed sores, other pressure injuries, diabetes related ulcers. So this to me was the lack of movement in your spirit, man. When you don't move from where you've been for so long, you just complacent where you are. You in that low to bar state, you just woo woo, you know, they dropped me, I'm crippled and I'm just sitting here. Or you the man at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, you just sitting there. That's when you have chronic wounds, you get bed sores, you know, and the natural bed sores come when you are in a certain posture for so long and you're never moved and nobody moves you or turns you, you begin to deteriorate because you're in a certain place for too long. So your chronic wound can be where you sat in a place for so long that you became deteriorated. So that's a wound that we can have because God has told you, get out that place, but you keep sitting in that same place and you start creating your own wounds. It's nobody else's fault. 
you stayed there for too long. And so there was a breaking down of what it was supposed to be a casing to cover you. It started breaking down and it started turning against you, which now opens you up to what? Infections and disease. Because when you stay in a place too long, jobs, churches, whatever the case may be, ministries, where God has told you to move because you want to be used and, and you know because you being used, you see the pastor doing things that are not right, but you like, I'm going to stay here because he uses me. Then you began to get the cubitus ulcers, which is a bed sore because you have laid on the bed of affliction for too long. And now you're starting to break down and you're starting to stink because the infection is starting to sunk, come in and start sinking in. And it's causing a stench on you because you are connected to something that you were supposed to pivot out of. That can be friendships too. That could be any ship that flows out, any, any type of ship that you can be on relationship wise, anything that you on that you know God has told you to move from, it's time to move or you're going to get spiritual decubitus ulcers. Amen. Then there's uh, the lack of using of the muscle of faith. We still talk about the chronic wound that when you're not using your muscle of faith, prayer, fasting, casting your cares and properly nurturing your spirit man. All those can be significant to chronic wounds, which is where you break the skin that needs to be healed. You're breaking things that's supposed to be whole in your life because you're not praying. You want God to move, but God is saying, I want you to pray. Prayer is communication. Can you just talk? You know, oh, oh yeah, I'm gonna go there. Y'all know I got the radio. I'm a radio person. Jodeci had a song. All of y'all ain't been saved all your whole life. And some of you might still listen to Jodeci when you with your boo thing. And that's all right with God, as long as it's not vulgar and out of order. But they had a song, come and talk to me. I really wanna, okay. God is saying, will you come and talk to me? I really wanna see you. I wanna talk to you. There are some things that I wanna talk to you about, but you fail to talk to God, why? Because he gonna tell you the real deal and you ain't ready to hear what's real. You say you want what's real. You want, you, I want somebody to help me. I really want to face my issues. But the one that can help you is the one beckoning for you and you drawing away from him instead of drawing near to him. So you're creating a chronic wound. You already got a wound. That's the bad part. You're already wounded. But when you do not address the wound, it becomes chronic because you began to deteriorate. Amen. And so let's talk about the stages. How, what I got on time? Because I just got a few more things. Three minutes. Three minutes? Okay. Well, I'm going to do this real quick. So stages of wound healing. You have the hematosis stage. That's the phase in which some types of wound will include um, the injury happened. And the first response from the body was to release the blood or the fluids to get it out of the body. You know, kind of like what Akilah said, when he got cut, the body immediately recognized that we needed to flow out. We needed to flow out. Some of us are, are bleeding where we were supposed to flow because we've not had an outlet for it to flow forth and to go forth. So we're bleeding where we're supposed to flow because immediately the response is the defense of the body to create a flow. I need y'all to catch that. I'm not just talking about the physical body, but even the spiritual body, the body of Christ. We were made to flow, not to bleed all over the place. So when we have uncontrollable bleeding, it's coming from a wound that we have not recognized needed to be defended, that needed to be mended, that needed to be taken care of, okay? So the afflicted uh, blood vessels, they reduce the blood flow and they create what's called a blood clot. So that's the blessed assurance, the barriers that are set and the parameters that are set, the standard that God will set in us or with us. That's that blood clot that causes you not to bleed to death. Oh, come on here. So then the infl inflammatory phase, I'm talking fast, so I'm about to be tongue twisted. Inflammatory phase is the cleaning and healing of the wound. This is where generally the inflammation in the area operates as the immune cells rush to the damaged tissue. The white blood cells enter the area to start cleaning out the wound and move any waste away from the site of the body. So that's the cleansing phase. When you recognize that you've been wounded, it's time to cleanse your, your wound. You cannot keep putting stuff over the wound and you do not do the disinfecting. You 
do not do the antiseptic. You do not do the cleaning out of the debris that could have gotten in the open place that caused your wound to festate. When a wound is not clear, uh, clean properly, it will begin to festate, meaning it gets infectious. It can start swelling up, puffing up. It can get that old yellowish looking skin look to it. It can start bubbling up from the inside because why? It has set up infection because there was no cleansing. What is cleansing? I'm glad you asked. It's the prayer. Prayer. Offering yourself up as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Lord, here I am. Is something wrong with me? And I need your help. No different than the baby, uh, not prophesied, but shared in her testimony when she said she came to Texas and she said, Lord, send me someone. And we met in a place that we never knew we were going to meet. If you have wounds, you will miss the appointed time that you're supposed to be in that if you are the one called to help someone who has a wound, you will miss the opportunity to be a help. And then you will become a hindrance because you're missing in action. So this is why it's important for us to get this wound, th this stuff down today so that we can come off of this live, off of the Zoom, I'm sorry, and be different than we were before. So we won't keep nurturing places that we were supposed to be healed in. We can go ahead and let the air hit that wound and began to start generating what? A scab on it so that it can start to heal. When the scab shows up, it shows that there is healing that is taking place, that that thing is no longer in a place that it was in before. But some of us don't have scabs because we've been covering up the wound. Amen. I'm not going to give y'all all the rest of them. I can send them to you in email if you want them. But I want to get to this part, the part where uh, we talk about what we do to be better, right? We cleanse the wound, like I told you. First John 1 and 19, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A wound is unrighteous. Why? Because we were never supposed to stay in affliction. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God does what? Deliver us from them what all not some of them but all of them so if we're still in a wounded state we first have to question are we the righteous then we have to question why we have not been delivered from the affliction of the wound what are we doing to block our own deliverance amen so then after you're cleansing that's with prayer Come to him earnestly, asking in faith that he will heal you and make you whole. And we must be willing to receive our healing. Healing is always available, but the problem is, do you receive it? You can have it in your face, but if you don't take ownership, it cannot do what it needs to do in you. Amen. All right. The second, and I got one more, if you'll bear with me. The second one is to protect the wound from vulnerability. Protection, we have to protect our wound. We have to make the choice to forgive whoever it was, whatever it was, and then know that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wound. The very scripture that we're standing on, 147 Psalms and three, just as he, we would bandage up a wound for protection from germs and things around it that could do further harm, spiritual wounds must be guarded from the outside forces that will slow or stop the healing, even cause more injury while trusting that Jehovah is doing his part to bind up our wounds and ultimately heal us. We can help by diligently protecting the wound. That means staying away from things that you know are no good for you. That means not going and answering the phone when the booth ain't called, when you know every time he called, you wind up in bed with him. You have to begin to be a what? Uh, I think it was Apostle uh, Angelica gave us 1 Peter 5 and 8. You gotta be sober, clear-minded and alert. In other words, the Lord say, be accountable. Be a responsible vessel in your healing. Amen? And so um, the third thing is monitor the wound. Pay attention to the wound, not to nurture the wound in a sense of negativity, but to look at it, make sure it's properly healing right. In other words, do your maintenance checkup, go see a mentor, get you a life coach if you need to, get you a counselor in your life, get some godly counsel so that way you can monitor where you are, have check-in points. Hello, somebody. Have someone that you're accountable to. Have a prayer partner that says, hey, at six o'clock on Wednesdays, we're going to get on here and we're going to pray for the week. Or on Sunday, we're going to pray before the week. I might not be able to get on there at six o'clock with you every day, but at least if we start our week together in prayer, we set the tone. This is called monitoring your wound, making sure that you still at a check 
point where somebody can locate you. Oh, my God. Be sober. That was well, that was the scripture I had for that. So the uh, other one is uh, Romans 12 and two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, perfect will of Jehovah. Romans 12 and two, make sure you change your mindset. You heard that already today. So we won't even expound on that. So what I leave you with, what I leave you with is Proverbs 4, 20, 22, 20 through 22, Proverbs 4, verse 20 through 22. My son, no gender in the spirit. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and health. That means restoration. That means being better, coming out of a place of being wounded, but being healed. They are help to one's whole body. Amen. So we got to trust the great physician for healing because it's time to wear your scar as a badge and not as your armor. Your wound was never intended to be your armor. That's why you keep getting beat up because it does not have the ability to protect you. But it keeps putting you out there on front street. But it's your badge to have a testimony that God did what he did and he brought you this far. And if you made it to this place today, healing is already yours but you just got to receive it in the places that you have neglected to take it in amen so i'm gonna stop right there but i do have notes if you guys apostle approves and um she wants me to i can send my notes over to you guys so that way you can have them for reference because i did a little speed through on them so there we go amen hallelujah i'm done but whew, i pray that y'all were able to gather that and that it was really, you know, helpful for you because like I said, I wanted to take something that we understood, bringing it to the forefront so that we could parallel it. But I have the honor now for the final speaker, the closer of this uncut, mending the wounds, the very own founder, the very innovator, creator, of this segment that we are a part of that we have been so graciously brought into the assignment to do. Doctor, well, apostle, apostle, cause she earned it. Apostle, doctor, because she earned it. Michelle Foster, and she comes forth and she's ready to seal us off. I hope you are ready because you gotta get the closure to the womb. Amen. And so I am so honored to present to you guys. And I know I'm probably not introducing her to anyone because I believe all of you pretty much know her. But just in case you don't, I am presenting to you Dr. or Apostle Dr. Michelle Foster, who is the founder of Titus Two Homes. And she does great and, and, and I guess you would even say mighty exploits of ministry through her organization, she feeds and she she gives out and she, you know, supplies and she does all of these things by faith. She does it by faith and God honors her faith and he meets her at that place. And that's why you're seated here. So those of you who are her spiritual daughters, her spiritual nieces, her spiritual partners, I just am so honored to present her and allow her to come forth as her spiritual mother to bring us into the conclusion of this thing. All right, Apostle Dr. Mack, come on and bring us on in. Thank you. Wow. That word, I needed like three full plates. You know, like when you go to the buffet, you want to capture everything. So you get a plate over here, a plate over there, a plate over there. Then you get a bowl, you get a couple of silverware. That Yeah, it, yeah. That Thanksgiving, there they go, there you go. Mighty God, thank you guys. Thank you, mom. Um, I'm honored, I'm humble um, to sit before you guys. And like she said, I do this thing by faith. Even when it sounds crazy, even when God say, oh, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And my, in my natural mind, it just does not add up. But in my spirit mind, I say, okay, God. I hope y'all heard that. In my natural mind, 
It does not make sense. But in my spirit mind, I say, okay, God, I don't take it for granted. It's not about me, y'all. I'm just the vessel who's driving the bus, who's allowing the passengers on so that I can get them to their destination. Again, I'm the, I am the driver of the bus who welcomes the passengers on to get you to your destination. And a part of you getting you to your destination is you have to be uncut. Anyway, uh, the prayer has gone forth and the only thing that I'm gonna say is Father, fill my mouth. <laughs> Give me your words that I may speak your wisdom to your people. Continue to give them ears that they may be attentive, a heart where it's not offended, and a spirit that is yielded to receive what they need in order to be uncut so that the wounds can be mended. Father, we thank you for this hour, and we bless and give you praise for and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. We talked about so much, y'all. We talked about self-inflictions. We talked about uh, the self-inflictions as a result of not following instructions. We talked about repeated cycles. We talked about the need of reflection or the lack thereof, you not having the reflection when you need it. Uh, we talked about, let's see, uh, don't wanna relinquish yourself from the plan because you wanna do it your own self, right? Uh, we talked about uh, rejection, abandonment, creating wounds, trauma, old mindset, abrasions, lacerations, punctures, burns, avulsions. We talked about so much. And I'm going to close it out with trusting the process. We have to trust the process. In the midst of all of this, I don't care if your wounds was self-inflicted or somebody else did it. We always want to go back to the scripture, uh, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. God has a plan. It's his plan. Did you not realize that some of the affliction, even your own self-affliction, he does allow, right? Wounds from our jobs, Ill, wounds from illnesses, broken relationships, temptations, character assassinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can talk. Yeah, that part right there. The false accusations, the gossip, or the Bible refers to it as being a talebearer. You can't shut your mouth. You want to talk, you want to be in somebody else's lane. Yes, that, that causes wounds. Children acting a numb nut, your spouse and going cuckoo for Cocoa Puff. You name it. We didn't claim it, right? We didn't claim it. But you know what? Despite all of that, we must be confident in knowing that God began a good work in each and every one of us and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ's return. That's Philippians 1 and 6. We got to know that. We got to put that in front of the wounds. Listen, I'm going to take you on a journey, and I'm going to come from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, um, where Apostle Paul gave a very good example about wounds afflictions, and all of that. And I'm going to start off at verse 23. I'm just going to read this and we just going to go for the gusto. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. And I'm going to go from verse 23 to 28. And I'm reading from the NIV version. I like this version. And he says, are they servants of Christ? And in parentheses, he says, I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move, 
I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Uh-oh. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger. See, he was hungry. He, yes, yeah, starving, if you will. And thirst and have often gone without food. I have even been in the cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the church. Now that's the, that we talk about the church folks. Somebody mentioned the, the whole thing about church hurt, all that foolishness. Apostle Paul was a good example whose life was upside down. And I thought about the song, but I'm not going to sing that because it's not relevant. You know, upside down, boy, you turn me, but no. But you, some of y'all done gone through that motion because y'all like that. Wounds. But you know, in fact, Timothy said that Paul's life is being poured out like a drink offering and the time of his death had come in 2 Timothy 4. Paul went to prison. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was hungry. Listen, some of us have a hard time not eating for a few hours. You don't really want to turn over the plate. But imagine Apostle Paul going hungry for days, weeks, or even months. He was even afflicted by the cold weather. I don't know about y'all if you've ever been afflicted by cold weather where you get the blisters, the cold blisters on you. You can't move your hands. You can't move your feet. Listen, if I think about that, I was traumatized by that in my younger years. My oldest sister and I call ourselves going to the movies when we were living in Kansas City and it was storming outside. And when we came out from the movies going to see The Wiz, that kind of dates me. We come out, there's a storm, and we have to stand at the bus stop for three hours waiting on the bus. By the time we got home, I was walking like a robot because I and I was walking on my heels because my toes were frozen. I had frostbite. So can you imagine Apostle Paul going through that very affliction? He didn't even have a coat. Did I mention that? And some of you have a coat and you still whining. You whine in because you refuse to zip the coat up and you don't understand why the air is still coming through. Zip it up. We still complaining. We complain about the process so much. Paul even asked a question. He asked, are we really servants of Christ? But yet we complain it. We say, oh, the God inside of me. Oh, oh, yes, I'm this. We speaking in tongues and we doing it runs and we doing all of this. But are we really servants of Christ murmuring and complaining about the process that God ordained for us? He said, wait a minute. You are complaining and you holding on to stuff and yet I've been in prison. They beat me while I was in there. They beat me till I was almost dead. It was five times that I received at the hand of them, them, them their Jews. 40 lashes, less one. I was beaten with a rod. Y'all know what that looks like, a rod. Just imagine your shirt and your, your shower rod. Get beaten with that. And he was also beaten with stones. You know, some of you got stones in front of, in your front yard, making your yard look all pretty. Yeah, them their things, them stones. Those things that if you pick it up and you throw it through a window, it breaks. He was shipwrecked three times, unanchored at the sea. Y'all know what that means. In the motion in the ocean, there you go. He didn't have an ark like Noah. 
nor did he have what you call them things, the safety jacket. He didn't have any of that. So what happened? He became a danger in the waters, the rivers of waters. From the robbers who came and stole from him, dangers from his own peeps. But we don't, you know, them peeps, the ones that we say that, oh, that's my BFF. Oh, you know, we've been connected for 20 some odd years. You know, I grew up with them. I went to elementary school with them, middle school, high school. We was buddies in college. We was in the same fraternity, da, 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 da. Yeah, all of that. That's a whole nother teaching within itself anyway. When God say disconnect, we don't disconnect and we stay connected and yet we don't understand why we starting to smell or as Apostle Akilah say, stank nasty because you're choosing to stay connected to something that created a wound. A Band-Aid can't fix it. Stitches cannot fix it. It's time to be cut. But we're complaining about things when God say disconnect, when he say cut it off. And we don't understand why the, the wound is starting to stink. You don't smell it because you become immune to it. You don't understand the behavior that you have and yet you don't understand why you're still crying. It's because you become immune to the behavior, that thing called learned behavior that also creates wounds where the scab gets so thick, you can't peel it off. It has to be cut off through surgery because it's become so embedded beneath the skin. But you're complaining. Paul said he was in danger when he walked up and down the streets where he resided. He was in danger from those people who had false accusations against him. You know, the ones that you talk about behind closed doors because you're intimidated by them, because you're jealous of them, because you're envious of their gift. Oh, I wish I could hear like that. I wish I can speak in tongues like that. I don't know why I'm going there. But these wishful thinkings, is called coveting. You're creating yet more wounds. Paul had sleepless nights, y'all, but he didn't complain. And yet we complain when we don't get 30 minutes of sleep. Oh, and did I mention he did say he was hungry, right? He went hungry. He went hungry, right? He went hungry. He didn't complain. I bet you he was probably saying in the back of his mind, I can stand to turn over a plate and keep it away because I can stand a few, lose a few pounds. And here we are, we complain and yet we don't understand why our sugar is high. We don't understand why our blood pressure is high. We don't understand that yesterday we was able to wear a pair of pants, but today they too tight. The wounds that we inflict. He was cold. He suffered from anxiety and borderline depression, probably because of the church folks. You know, the ones that we call and we say, oh, them church folks, I got hurt, church hurt. Let me put a plug in when we say, we got to be careful when we say church hurt. Was it the entire church that hurt you or was it an individual in the church that hurt you? And while I'm on the subject, we must be careful to not point fingers at everybody else and not hold ourselves accountable for the part that we played. Wounds. We can't always say that everybody else inflicted the wounds on us when sometimes the wounds are self-inflicted. Anywho, what's interesting about this story of Paul and his suffering, he boasted about it. Not in a bad way. He boasted in so much that after all that he went through, he managed 
to endure the inflictions. He finished his race and kept his faith. Why? Because he trusted God's process. Many of us, we have an idea of what a process is, but we know very little about the logistics and the effects of our, of, of our effects, not just for ourselves, but for other people. Now, you know what? There's different kinds of processes. Now, I know I'm gonna take a little twist, but just go with me. <clears throat> we got several process examples. We got the process in the kitchen, we have the process in the bathroom. We have the process in the bedroom. And we even have a process that takes place even in our car. You said, well, where did that come from, Apostle? Did you not know that your car represents ministry? Probably not. Your vehicle holds passengers, but it can't go anywhere without tires. Nor can it stop to pick up more passengers if you don't have brakes. There is a maneuvering that has to take place within the process. But did you notice I mentioned three very specific rooms in each of your homes? I mentioned the kitchen, the bedroom, and the bathroom. Why? Because these are rooms that are very significant to each of us. Your kitchen is a place of preparation where you prepare meals. There is a process. And if you don't follow the process, you end up with burnt food or even a burned down kitchen. Your bedroom is considered a place of privacy. Uh, anyway. Some of y'all just invite any and everybody in your room and you don't understand why you are suffering from wounds. Your bedroom is also a place of rest and recovery, but some of you cannot recover because you refuse to rest. And then there is the bathroom. The bathroom is a place of dumping and cleansing. And I believe every single speaker mentioned about dumping in their own right, when it talks about deliverance and healing, you gotta dump some things in order to be healed. That be the place of the bathroom. But did you not understand that even in these places, there's a process in each and every room that has to take place in order for the sanctification you said, well, what is the sanctification? That is a place where you recover. That is a place where you have to trust the process. However, many times we, we fight the process or as Apostle uh, Mouton said, we wanna buck against the process. That bucking, that which, which creates, what is it called? The puncturing, the lacerations, because we want to buck up against the process because it doesn't, it doesn't look like the way we want it to look like. We buck up against it. We fight up against it. We don't want to go through the process. We want to do the microwave central with the process, right? Or we want to reject the process. But did you not know your sanctification in the midst of your process is what causes you to be free? And you say, I want my men's, my wounds to mend. I want my wounds to go away. I'm starting to smell them. They don't smell right. They smell sour. They stink. And of course, I want this, this thing, what you call it? You said sanctification process. I want to be sanctified. I want that part in my process. But apostle, this process hurts. It's painful. And sometimes it brings back old memories. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear that. I don't even want to feel it. I don't want to go through that. But did you not know that God's work 
God is at work in your process. He is at work in my process. Whether we accept it or not, God's work is in the process. Did I not mention to you that God said he who begun a work, it may look different to each person, but he began the work and he's going to complete it in the return of Christ. There are seasons that are filled with loss, affliction, silence, pain, embarrassment, and so much more. Your process may even be painful to some degree. You may even encounter wounds from your past. They might just show up. You, they might show up on your phone in a text message. You may be minding your business, scrolling on social media, and you scroll right to this person's page, even though they weren't, they were not your friend. And what does it do? It causes a trigger. Just by you remembering or even looking at that person's face, a pain that is so unbearable, you can hardly stand. It causes you to have sleepless nights. You're not able to focus anymore. What about the pain from a divorce, trauma, abuse, some type of abuse, whether it's rejection, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, financial abuse. Yeah, that's that kind of abuse too. Leader abuse, whatever your abuse is. At the end of the day, we still must trust the process in order for our wounds to mend. But here's the thing, the process requires a prerequisite. Y'all know about a prerequisite, right? You know, when you go, when you went to school, you went into college and you wanted this particular class because that class looked good and that, that class was all up in your major. But then when you started reading the description in the booklet or on, on, the, on the internet, it said that you had to have this class before you can enroll in that class. That's your prerequisite. You said, well, I don't understand, Apostle. What are you talking about? There's a prerequisite in order for your wounds to be mended. And you said, but I've been afflicted. Now what? Now what? I've been afflicted. You said, my afflictions hurt, and it's a reminder when I lay down at night, I can't sleep because I'm tossing and turning because I'm thinking about what so-and-so did to me. I try to suppress it so that I don't remember the pain of it all, a pain that has caused me to be unforgiving. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, I'm going there. A pain that has caused me to be unforgiving, that I'm still holding on this unforgiveness to the person who did something to me 25 years ago. It's caused me to be even a little angry and, oh yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm even bitter if I, if I wanna be honest, I'm bitter because of the way it happened and by whom it happened. And there was nobody there. God, you said that you would cover me God, you said that you would not see the righteous forsaken, nor your seed begging bread, but why did I get afflicted by this person? Why am I still carrying and I still see this wound and I'm reminded by this wound all the time? Why am I being reminded that I just experienced the loss of somebody really, really close to me, my ace boom coon? someone that was knitted in my heart, my child who went wayward, my spouse who's acting cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, that person who I let close in, you know, that person that came into the inner courts, they were real close to me and it caused me to be wounded. I felt like there was an uprooting of life and it left a hole there because the knit's not there anymore. I tried filling it with fillers. I tried filling it with sex and I'm not married. 
I tried filling it with food and I get sick to my stomach. I tried filling it with watching pornography or even self pleasures that only worked for so long. It was only temporary. There's so much stress and duress of it all. These wounds, the emotional pain, these wounds. I just don't know what to do, these wounds. It feels like the pain has gone on forever, these wounds. It doesn't matter what your wounds are. We have to trust the process. We must trust in the Lord and lean not to our own understanding and let God direct our paths. I know, I know you saying, well, Apostle, I really haven't been leaning not to my own understanding. Instead, I've been leaning on my own understanding because, you know, I don't even know how I feel half the time. And at other times, well, I just feel pain. Sometimes I've even feel like I'm numb, like you can poke me and I don't even feel it no more, the wounds of it all. You see, first, we must give him the pain, the hurt, the unforgiveness, all of that weight of those things called wounds. Even when it's your first time feeling it, is going to take practice and trust on your part and not being afraid of partnering with Holy Spirit so that he can activate our wound mending. You know, Holy Spirit activate that part. Holy Spirit can't activate nothing if we refuse to partner with him so that we can mend the wounds. Oh, and then I forget to tell you, it's gonna take some practice too. This is an area where many of us fail. We're inconsistent, but we want God to snap his finger and say, heal my wound. Remember I said there is a prerequisite, there is a partnership. But what happens is we partner with Holy Spirit only at our convenience. We're not consistent. We want what we want right now, like a microwave. Or like when we go through the, 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 the drive through I want it right now. I can't wait. I don't want to go through the process of seasoning the meat, tenderizing the meat, letting it sit for a few days so that the word of the seasoning can get down in the nitty gritty of the meat and then put it in the oven so that it can bake. We want what we want right now. And we don't understand why we're still wrong. The wounds of it all. Do you not realize the microwave syn syndrome does not work? Did you know that patience and trusting the process is the fruit of the spirit according to Galatians 5 and 22. There is such a thing called a trial during our patience. It's called building process. This is where we must stand the test of time in the process so that our wounds can be mended. And according to James 1 and 4, we must also let endurance and steadfastness and patience, there go that word again, that P word, have full play and do a thorough work in us so that we may be fully developed without defects and lacking nothing. Mending the wounds of those who we have wounded. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna forget about that. We talked about our wounds where people wounded us. But what about when we, when we wound other people? Can I just go there for a minute? What about when we wound other people? We can't rush someone else's process 
of mending wounds that we caused. You hurt somebody, but you don't want them to go through their process of allowing a wound to heal, a wound that you created. a wound that you caused. It doesn't work like that, according to Matthew 5 and 24. It says to leave your offering at the altar and go first to be reconciled to thy brother and then present your offering to the Lord and be reconciled quickly. He didn't say labor on it. Let me think about it. He didn't say that. He said, you make amends, then you go, you go reconcile quickly. Make the wrong right in the eyes of the Lord. And not the way you want it. It must mend the wounds the way God's way. Not your way that seems right. Because your, your way that seems right unto your person, but at the end of the day, it's a way of death according to Proverbs 14 and 12. In other words, allow the wounded time to heal the wounds of it all. We've covered so much, so much meat, but I wanted to make sure that we understood there is a process. And in the process of mending wounds, we have to trust the process that God has ordained for us. Not what we think, not what we want, and not what feels good to us. So in closing, I want to give you a few pointers to help you trust the process. We have to wait patiently. According to Galatians 22, patience is the fruit of the spirit. Number two, it's God's timing because he set the watch. You did not. According to Exodus 13, 17 through 18, God, when he led the Israelites the longer and the harder way on their journey to the promised land. He took them the long route. Why? Because he knew they wasn't ready. She ain't ready. She says she ready, but she really not ready. We want to rush the process, but it's in God's timing. If he got to take you down a, another road, let him take you down another road. Why? Because he wants to teach you something. Perhaps you missed something. Perhaps there's still something that needs to be uncovered. You say you want to get to the promised land? Oh God, I want my promise, but you want the shortcut. No, it's in God's timing. In his timing, he may take us on another road because we need to be cultivated a little more. We need to be sharpened a little longer. We need to be trained. He need to have another conversation with us because we say and we tell people we gave it all to the Lord, but we still hide in this little old thing over here called a lack of accountability. We don't want to own our part of what we did. Number three, rely on God and not always on the people. Hello, somebody. Proverbs 16 and nine. Let the Lord order your steps. Proverbs 20 and 24. A man's steps are ordered by the Lord. How can a man understand his ways? We can't. If we don't have the Lord in, pre in present in it, Number four, plant the seed and wait. Wait for it. You say, well, what do you mean by planting the seed? You're planting the seed, which is the word of God, and wait. You keep planting. You keep planting. You keep planting. You keep planting the word of God and wait. Don't pull it up prematurely. Ecclesiastics 3 and 1 reminds us to everything, there is a season and a time for every matter or purpose under heaven. So if we pull it up too quickly, it may very well cause you to go backwards. Don't do things prematurely. Wait on the Lord. 
And the last one is nurturing while waiting. Feed yourself the word of God. Get acquainted with the word of God. Drink it, bathe in it. For the appointed time will be fulfilled and will not disappoint. Though we tarry, wait. Habakkuk 2 and 3. That is the process in which we need to follow in order for the wounds, the wounds, the wounds, your wounds, my wounds, all wounds, we all got wounds, in order for the process to render its mending. Father God, we bless your name. We thank you, O oh God, for this time, O oh gracious Father. I thank you, O oh gracious Father, for every speaker who has labored, who has prepared the meal and served it to your daughters. I praise you and I thank you, O oh Father God, and I pray that they ate from each pot. They chewed slowly, O oh God, and did not swallow quickly so that the meat of your word will stick. Father, I thank you for your word that does not return unto you void, but shall accomplish that which you please and it shall prosper where it is sent. Holy Spirit, teach your daughters to be patient with your process for their own lives, not to rush the clock and start doing things their way, that they will learn to lean on you more and less on themselves and not idolize their leaders. Help us, oh Father, to learn to seek out the right seeds of your word, plant those seeds, fertilize those seeds, and water them by being consistent, and then wait for them to take root and produce the fruit that you see fit. Father, I thank you for the manifestation of deliverance process, the healing process, the restoration process, the reconcili reconciliation process. Yes, God, even some reconciling with you. The reconciliation process of those we have wounded and taken for granted. Hmm. Father, we understand that though we have experienced the pain more than others, the shame, the embarrassment, and all of that that comes with wounds, there is a purpose in the pain. And in order to get to the promise, we must embrace the process. You said, oh, Father God, that in all of our getting, get an understanding. Now that we have clarity and a better understanding of the importance of trusting your process and not our process, help us to embrace it. You know better than we do because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we thank you for what you are doing and what is to come. We glorify and we bless your holy and righteous name. We thank you, O oh gracious Father, that the ink that we put on the paper will not be wasted. We thank you, Father God, that the paper that we've written on will not be wasted. We thank you, O oh gracious Father, for the time that we spent here in this Zoom room will not be wasted nor taken for granted. Instead, Father, hold us accountable in following the instructions. Ride our heels place people in our pathway to constantly have us to remember and to be reminded that it is necessary for us to trust your process. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.